Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn, and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. This quarter, we are studying God's mission, my mission, and today is Lesson 8, Mission to the Needy. I so appreciate this quarterly study. It was kind of, uh, we had many contributors, let me put it that way, the directors of the Global Mission Center and Adventist Mission, all contributed and even a few retired directors and we want to thank them for their work. Let me introduce your family, my family, the Sabbath School panel, Ryan Day. Amen. Yeah, I have a lesson, uh, well, Monday's lesson entitled Christ Method Alone. I'm excited about it. Amen. And James Rafferty. Good to be here, Shelley. I have Tuesday's lesson, Refugees and Immigrants. Wonderful. Daniel Perrin. Thank you. I have Wednesday's lesson to help the hurting. Oh, wonderful. And Jill Morricone. Thank you so much, Shelley. On Thursday, we look at greater love. I love this lesson and I appreciate what each of you bring to the table from your studies. Jill, would you like to pray for sure. us? Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and we thank you that you've called us to mission and that you call us to mission to those who need it most. We ask right now as we open up your word, would you open up our minds and hearts yes, to receive what the Spirit has for us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our memory text, and I, I wish you'd make this an affirmation from Scripture and speak it over your life. Jesus said, the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. That's Matthew 25, 40. We, our destiny is to become like Christ. Mm -hmm. We are to, he lived by the law of love. We are to live by the law of love. We are to reflect his love, his light and his mm -hmm. life to the world. And as we draw close to others and meet their needs, we are reflecting Christ. And it's interesting mm -hmm. that Jesus said, when we do the works of God, we're fulfilling the law of love and we're actually ministering to him. Mm. Boy, that really opens your eyes. Minister to others, minister to Christ. The quarterly says in this week's lesson, our topic, Mission to the Needy, shows that God has a plan to reach those who might be needy in any number of ways. Their needs might be physical, emotional, financial, or even social. That is, mm. some might be deemed as outcasts from their community or family. Whatever the needs are, we must be ready to do what we can do to help. This is a central part of what it means to be a Christian and what mission must include. So by helping the needy, those in need, we are ministering to Christ. Mm -hmm. I love Sunday's lesson, the faith of friends. And if you will open your Bible to Luke chapter five, we are going to study a story that we find also in Matthew nine and Mark two, but this is Luke chapter five, verse 17. And Luke writes, Now it happened on a certain day, as he, Jesus, was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. The event mm -hmm. happened in Capernaum. Mm -hmm. Now there was beginning a controversy between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. And they were watching him. He had reports of miracles, of healing the sick, healing lepers, and reports that he was someone more than just a rabbi. So these Pharisees and teachers of the law came from all parts of the country, even as far away as 80 miles from Jerusalem. They came to investigate him, to catch him. No doubt they were trying to find fault with him. 
and make charges against him. Mm -hmm. So here in Capernaum, then Luke mentions in the rest of Luke 5, 17, the B part, it says, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The power of the Lord, the healing power of the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit was always residing in Jesus. And then in 5, verse 18, then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd. Now, let's just hit the pause button. Here we've got a group of men carrying a paralytic man on a stretcher. And these four stretcher bears couldn't get through the crowd that was beginning to gather outside the house. They were listening to Jesus. Mm -hmm. he, they couldn't get into Christ's presence. But you know what? Even though a barrier, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes people can be a barrier to get to Jesus, mm -hmm. but even though the barrier existed, these men were determined. They had such a determined faith. They were gonna find another way. So it goes on in verse 19. And it says, they went up on the housetop. They let them down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. Determined faith caused them to think outside the box. How often do we think of mission or ministry or leading to people, in, uh, to people, to God? in only one way. We've got to start thinking outside the box. Maybe we need to go to the roof that's that ceiling in our head and remove some tiles mm -hmm. so that we can lower the needy before Jesus. <laughs> and you know what? Jesus loved to see faith in action. Just imagine how he felt when he saw all five men had the faith. The man on the, on the stretcher had faith too. But He's, it says in verse 20, when he saw their faith, he said to him, the paralytic, man, your sins are forgiven you. Mm. Now, this is an unmistakable claim mm -hmm. to deity. Mm -hmm. And there are Pharisees that are standing by, watching, trying to catch him. And verse 21 says, the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You know, the, the reaction of the unbelieving Jews, they reasoned correctly in their minds that it was blasphemy to claim to forgive sins unless yeah. you were God. Mm -hmm. The one thing they weren't thinking, even though they'd heard all these reports of Jesus, they just failed to consider that Jesus was God. So verse 22, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, rise up and walk. You know, Jesus, is reading their minds and their hearts. Mm -hmm. He knows what's in their hearts. And he's pointing out that, I guess anyone could say your sins are forgiven. How would you prove that? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no way to prove that. So which is easier, to say that or to say rise up and walk? And what we've got to recognize is that that power, both of them, whether it's to forgive sins or to, to heal, There's, the source of that power is God. Mm -hmm. So to prove that he had authority to right. forgive sins, what does he do? He heals the man. Verse 24, he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, mm -hmm. arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately the man rose before them. He took up what he had been lying on and he departed to his own house, glorifying God. Oh, can you imagine mm. being completely paralyzed and now you're healed. Jesus gave him 
a double blessing. He forgave his sins and he healed his physical malady. Mm -hmm. One encounter with Jesus can change a life. So verse 26 says, they were all amazed and they glorified God. This is the crowd now. The crowd that's in the house, the crowd that's outside of the house, listening through the doors and the windows. Mm -hmm. And they were all amazed, Luke said, and they glorified God. And they were filled with fear. And they said, we have seen strange things today. You know, Luke is the only one who records the three reactions of the people. Mm -hmm. They were amazed, mm -hmm. they glorified God, and they were filled with fear. Now, the man had faith, but he wasn't able to get to Jesus without stretcher bearers. And four of his friends assumed that responsibility. You know, sometimes the circumstances of life overwhelm us. Maybe you've had a child who has been killed. Maybe you've had a diagnosis of stage four cancer or your spouse has. Mm. Sometimes maybe a storm went through and washed away your, or, or burned up your home and everything that's in mm. it. Sometimes circumstances interfere, our emotional instability, if you will, interferes with our ability to press into God's presence. Sometimes we need stretcher bearers yeah. to bring us into his presence. I believe those who intercede for others, those who pray with others, who when you see someone who is needy, someone who is hurting, it doesn't have to be a physical way that you're carrying them to Jesus. It could be as simple as interceding for them in prayer, mm -hmm. praying with them to usher them into the presence. Those people, I think of our pastoral <coughs> department as stretcher bearers. Yes. People call here and they find it impossible to get to the Lord. But here's what this, this quarterly says. Jesus himself demonstrates how to help the helpless and is calling us to do the same. First, we become their friends, then we learn about their needs, and finally, we lead them to Jesus, who is the only one who can help them. This is what the men in this story did. We need to do likewise in whatever situation we find ourselves. Help lead people to the only one who can help them. Hey Amen. Thank you so much, Shelley. That was a powerful lesson, a great start uh, to get us started during this week. And I'm Ryan Day. I have Monday's lesson and I'm so thrilled to have this because uh, this message is dear to my heart. The title of Monday's lesson is Christ's Method Alone. And uh, I use this method because it's the only method, as we're about to find out, that, that gives true success in reaching people. And uh, when I go and travel, and sometimes I'm invited to give evangelistic trainings, outreach trainings, and how to teach an evangelism cycle in, in local churches, um, this comes up over and over and over. So I, I encourage you, my, my friends, to tune in. This is important for us to understand. Let's go to John chapter 5. We're going to start there with uh, a, a, a precious story. I love the story in Scripture. Uh, it really just shows us the heart of Jesus and wanting to meet the needs of those uh, who are in need. Uh, and uh, in John chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1 and we're going to read through to verse 9. The Bible says here that after this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, mm -hmm. uh, having five porches. <laughs> In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Mm. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Then the sick man answered and said, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, 
let me give you a Bible study and then I will heal you. <laughs> Is that what it says here? No. no. Mm -hmm. Notice what it says. Then Jesus said to him, rise up, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. Now I was obviously being a little sarcastic when I said that one line. I, I said that for a reason because uh, this lesson is entitled Christ method alone. If we're going to reach the needy or anyone for that matter, uh, Christ method alone is what brings true success. And those aren't my words. This comes from Ministry of Healing, page 143. Listen very carefully to what the inspired words say. It says Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. So how many methods are there that actually work? One. 27, right? Whatever method did you think? No. Whatever method that we feel or believe is the right method may not necessarily be the right method in reaching people. There's only one, and that's the only way uh, that's right, and that's Christ's method, Christ's way. But what is Christ's method alone? It tells us here, Ministry of Healing, page 143. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. So he mingled with them. He showed his sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Then he bid them or bade them to follow him. Uh, so let's break this down. There are five different things that we must follow in order to properly and rightfully reach someone for Christ. I only say this because many times we, I have been to many small group Bible studies, I've been visiting many churches, um, and I have heard this come across so many times from many different people. And that is, you'll hear often people say, well, how many Bible studies did you get this week? Mm -hmm. and, and understand, I, I am the largest proponent of Bible studies. I love small group Bible studies. Anytime that we have an opportunity to share the Word of God, we should be sharing. And so please don't get me wrong in what I'm about to say. But oftentimes we become so Bible study centralized or focused that we forget the proper steps that need to be taken before the person we're witnessing to is ready to receive the seed that needs to be sown. Take, take for yourself the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower goes out to sow. Some falls by the wayside, some stony ground, some uh, among the thorns, and some among good ground. But notice before that seed can be sown, and I usually ask this, people this when I give these evangelistic trainings or even at my uh, evangelistic series, I'll say, how many of you have a garden or have, or have ever ran a garden or prepared a garden? And you know, people will raise their hands and I'll say, okay, how many of you before you do anything else, the first step you do, you go into the cabinet or go into wherever you keep seed, you grab that that seed and you just go out to the naked ground and you just start tossing seeds all over the place. No, you don't do that. That's silly, right? And before you sow the seed, you have to prepare the soil. There are some processes that must take place before the soil is ready to receive the seed for the seed to do what it can do best. And that's, of course, sprout and then grow into something that you can harvest. The same message and the same principles apply to witnessing and mission. We must make sure that we take the proper processes to make sure that we are going to be that we are going to be a success and successful in reaching souls for Jesus. The first thing that we must do is what Jesus did. Jesus just didn't go out, you know, slamming people with Bible studies and, and theological concepts and all these because they just need to hear it. He was he only did that when those people were ready to receive it. Yeah. The first thing he did, according to Christ's method alone, was that he mingled. And it says here, the lesson says, first we must mingle with the helpless spend time getting to know them and understand their needs with the intention of doing good for them, spending time with them. How can you get someone to trust you to give them the truth if you haven't gotten to know them, if you haven't become a friend to them first? You, get, you have to become a friend. You have to spend time with them and gain that trust before they're willing to listen to you, to speak to them or to teach them the truth. Secondly, we must show sympathy to them. Okay, we need to show sympathy. Are you showing sympathy to those who are in need? This can be challenging. The Lesson says in some cases because of distrust and because sometimes people use kindness as a means of winning the confidence of someone whom they later abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that can be an issue and I have experienced that myself. Nevertheless, it says God is calling us to show sympathy without expecting anything in return. 
We show sympathy because He showed sympathy. Amen. He showed sympathy to you. He showed sympathy to me. If we're not showing sympathy for others, then my friends, we're not doing the proper methods in reaching the soul for the kingdom of God. The third step to, uh, to minister to is through their needs. We need to minister to their needs. Do you care about the needs of others? This involves more than just words. And I've heard many times a brother or sister go to someone and say, you know, I, I really need help with this or I really need help with that or I'm struggling in this area. And oftentimes we kind of give those empty words of, well, I'm sorry you're going through that. I'm going to pray for you. I mean, don't get me wrong. I know we mean well when we say those type of things, but many times God's way of ministering to that person is more than just giving words like, I'm going to pray for you, but rather doing something about it to meet those needs is what we need to do. Then the fourth step is winning their confidence. Once you've mingled with them, once you've showed sympathy, once you have met their needs, you will win their confidence. When we minister to people, we help them and, and and they will learn to trust us and what we say to them so that when we talk to them about Jesus, they will be more open to listen. And then, of course, the last step, this is where Bible study comes in, because once you've gained their trust and won their confidence, the last step is, of course, to lead them to Jesus, an act that requires faith from both you and the one whom you help. And so, my friends, we have to learn to prepare that soil. We have to learn to go through these processes. Christ's method alone, that's the only appropriate way in order for us to go into the field and to be successful. But you know, many people are not in the fields as they should be. We want to sit at the table. We want to be at the Father's table, but we're not willing to go into the field and do what is necessary. As I was preparing this lesson, I thought of that Probably, and there's no other song that has ever been written that's more true than that of the song written by Lenny Wolf, My House is Full. Listen to the words of this song. I love this. It says, push away from the table. Look out through the window pane. Just beyond the house of plenty lies a field of golden grain. And it's ripe unto harvest, but the reapers, where are they in the house? Oh, can't the children hear the father sadly say? And then the chorus, sad but true, my house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work? for me today it seems my children all want to stay around my table but no one wants to work in my field yes no one wants to work in my field it's sad but it's true many times we want to reap of the benefits at the table where the Father is. But my friends, until that time, we need to know that it's our mission to collaborate with Him and going out into the field, using Christ's method alone, meeting the needs of others, mingling with them, showing those sympathies, gaining the confidence of our brothers and sisters who are in need. And then once we have won that confidence, bidding them to follow Jesus, sharing the good news, the gospel of Jesus, and then one day Jesus will come back, He'll gather us all at the harvest, and we will sit at the Father's table. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Stay tuned. We'll be back in 30 seconds after this announcement of how you can find our website and watch every Sabbath School panel program that's ever been recorded. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 abiansabbathschoolpanelcom a clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Now we'll continue this wonderful study and James Rafferty has our next lesson. Thank you, Shelley. We are in Tuesday's lesson and it's entitled Refugees and Immigrants. The Cordley says the topic of immigrants and refugees has become a hotly debated subject, especially because there are so many of them today. Thank you, Shelley, for this lesson. Whether displaced by war, natural disasters, or for the hope of a better economic future, millions around the world have been uprooted from their homes and are in desperate need of help. Now, the Cordley says in Matthew 2, 13 and 14, Jesus was a refugee. Just stop there and think about that. Jesus was a mm. refugee. And when you think about that, 
His earthly parents, Joseph and Mary, were forced to flee from Bethlehem by night, seek refuge in Egypt to escape a murderous hand of a ruler named Herod. So they were seeking political asylum. Jesus was a refugee. In fact, all of us are refugees. Unless we were born in the Middle East and our family goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, all of us are refugees. You know, Noah was a refugee in a sense, having to leave his land because of the flood. And we all come from Noah. Even natives are refugees at some point or another. I know my mom was a refugee from Ireland. Well, I should say she was an immigrant from Ireland. There's a difference. Immigra immigrated when she was 14 years old to the United States, sponsored by my aunt and then my father. My father was a refugee of sorts. Uh, originally from Africa, I don't know how many years back, and of course he was brought over in slavery. So all of us have this connection going all the way back, and therefore Christ comes as us. He comes as a refugee. He comes as one who needs asylum. He comes to the place where we are. He comes to relate to us, and Joseph and Mary, his parents, have fled to Egypt. Now, as they escape the murderous hand of Herod, the quarterly goes on to say, the Bible says nothing about their experience in Egypt, but it's not hard to imagine that it was challenging. Can you imagine being a Hebrew, being a Jew and going to Egypt, you know, a country that has a different culture, different religion, different background? And um, these challenges, of course, face refugees today, the quarterly goes on to say. In fact, somewhat parallel to how Jesus' family sought asylum in a foreign land, many Muslims, many Buddhists, many Hindus, many Christians, many, many non-religious persons are seeking asylum in new lands today as well. So Joseph and Mary went to Egypt, but they went to Egypt temporarily. That's what the Bible tells us. Like them, there are also immigrants who do not want to stay permanently. They're looking for temporary relief from a difficult situation. When I went to Pakistan years ago, there were hundreds of thousands of refugees from Afghanistan in wow. Pakistan. They were intense. They weren't planning to stay in Pakistan. They wanted to go back to Afghanistan, but temporarily they were taking refuge and asylum in Pakistan. And often it's for political reasons. Uh, sometimes, of course, it's due to war or famine. Some have resources, some have work skills, some plan to go back to their country when their time is right. This has been the case of many in the Bible. Abraham, for example, took refuge in Egypt for a time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So did Jacob. Mm -hmm. Jacob and his sons, under God's leading in Joseph's captivity, ended up in Egypt for a time. But they talked about the day when they would go back to the country God had ordained yeah. for them. Even Joseph and Mary sought asylum in this foreign land with the laws and the customs that were much different than their own for political reasons. Their resources were, were gold and, and some, you know, spices given to them by the wise men. And Joseph was a carpenter, which, of course, is a skill that can be uh, used anywhere. You can find work as a carpenter. So they had some skills they brought with them. Jacob, too, was an immigrant early in his life who went back to his distant family ties in Syria mm. as he fled from his brother Esau. And Jacob had nothing, not even a change of clothes. He had nothing. And yet he was willing to work hard seven years for one wife and another seven years for another. Okay. Uh, but, and he was even taken advantage by his uncle Laban. And we can read that in Genesis chapters 28 through 31. But the reality is this. As true believers, we are actually immigrants in this present world, mm -hmm. right? True Christians are all seeking asylum from the prince of this world. <laughs> so as Christians, we're all seeking refuge. Mm -hmm. The prince of this world, his presidents, his prime ministers, his kings. True Christians are all being persecuted, hated, mistreated, generally displaced. We are pilgrims and strangers in this present world, tearing but a night here in this country so dark and dreary, I have long wandered forlorn and weary. I'm a pilgrim, mm. I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. There is a city to which I journey. My redeemer, my redeemer is its light. There is no sorrow, nor any crying, nor any tears, nor any dying. We are pilgrims, we are strangers. We can tarry, we can tarry but a night. Mm -hmm. So Jesus came to us as us. The place that we're going, of course, is the heavenly Jerusalem. It's not another country or another place on planet Earth. Eventually, we're going to be in that new heaven, in that new earth. And this heavenly Jerusalem actually has an immigration policy. <laughs> you can't just show up at its borders and expect to walk in. 
<laughs> you are definitely not getting in if you're bringing in lawlessness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The heavenly country requires loving service from all who enter there. Criminals against God's law are not welcome. If you want to live off the government of that heavenly land flowing with milk and honey without reciprocating, you will not be welcome there. Mm -hmm. Every immigrant entering the glorious land must show that they will be obedient to the laws and principles of its government. Mm -hmm. The law of loving service is foundational to this country, this heavenly country of liberty for all, and the ruler within its borders, the highest representative of its government, the God of heaven, the true and coming ruler of this earth made new is also a servant. <laughs> In fact, he will welcome each one of us with a grand feast and all who want this better life, all who are honestly seeking asylum from the, the spiritual darkness of this present world will all have a place at his table and he, the king of heaven and earth, will serve mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He will serve us. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Have you noticed how true Christianity crosses all racial and cultural borders? I mean, I've traveled the world. I've been to Europe and Asia, Middle East and Africa. I've been to South and Central America and always found a place of refuge among God's true people, always. In our local church, we have members from every ethnic background, Asian, black, Hispanic, yes, and even white. And we are family. We are family. Amen. Here at 3ABN, located in Southern Illinois, we experience this merging of race and culture and ethnicity as one body in Christ, ready to serve. Amen. You see, it's the devil that's seeking to divide us. Amen. The devil that's seeking to put up these barriers between these races and cultures. We are one. We are one family. The Bible says, wherefore, remember Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, that ye being in time past gentles and Gentiles in the flesh, who were called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time that you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes afar off are made, afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Yeah. Mm. For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments containing ordinances, for to make in himself of the two one new man making peace. Mm -hmm. That ye might be reconciled both unto God and one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And he came and he preached peace to you which were afar off and them which were near, so that through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are built together for a habitation of God. Mm. Generally speaking, the gospel does more than call us out of ethnic comfort zones. The gospel moves us out. It compels us, it propels us, it completely obliterates worldly walls of separation and unites people in its melting pot of nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples. Soon all the immigrants of this world will find entrance into the heavenly borders and experience the eternal life of loving service and tireless energy so hoped for and longed for in this present world. So there we are, we're pilgrims and strangers, and yet God has brought us together. He's brought us together under his government, under the principles of love and service. He's united us mm -hmm. as a family. He's broken down all ethnic racial borders and lines and distinctions, and he's recovered us to what he began for us yes. in the Garden of Eden. And each one of us is called to enter into that experience in our own personal relationship and how we, we react and relate to others. Jesus Christ himself entered into that experience and he calls us to abide in him and to experience that loving relationship with him and with others. Amen. 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 Yeah. Great stuff. Powerful lesson. Thank you, Pastor James. I'm Daniel Perrin. I have Wednesday's lesson to help the hurting. Now, it really doesn't matter how well off someone is or how good they seem to have it. This world is full of hurting people and there's all kinds of hurting. Marriages and parenting and uh, regrets and loneliness, health and finances. The 
painful past. And, and as I, I say these words, I know that I'm touching people who are watching and listening and you're saying, that's me, I'm hurting. Which is why that song, People Need the Lord, touches a chord with people, still does. Mm -hmm. These opening words, every day they pass me by. I can see it in their eye. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. Mm -hmm. On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. Mm. To these people, Jesus had a mission. Mm. That mission was himself. Mm. Amen. To these people today, Jesus has a mission. And it's still himself ministered through you and me, us as a church. Which is why the title of, for this lesson's quarterly is so good. God's mission, my mission. Mm -hmm. They're one and the same. And Jesus' mission, Luke 4, verse 18, he's showing us that his mission was already predicted long in advance, quoting Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I love this line here. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Yes. People who are hurting to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. I want to give just a few snapshots of what that looked like and can look like and is to look like in our lives. Mark 1, 41. I love this text right here. Then Jesus moved with compassion, yes. stretched out his hand and touched him. And he said, I am willing, be cleansed. You don't have to be a miracle worker. You don't have to have a four-year degree to have compassion, Amen. to stretch out your hand, to touch someone. Almost anybody can do that. There are people in our churches who have not been hugged in years, no. perhaps even since childhood. I think about going to a nursing home as, as I do with my family on a Sabbath once a month with our church. And uh, we sing, we pray, we talk, and then we go from person to person yes. and ask them questions mm -hmm. and let them talk and hold their hand. And my kids make a little card, the little Sabbath school they're a part of makes little cards and hands them out. And we could cut that time short, but oh, how precious that is for people who some of them say, no, nobody comes to visit me. Mm -hmm. The, the financial vice principal at the school where I worked had a sign in his office that said, the right answer is compassion. Amen. Mm. I took right. that and I put it in my office too because I want to be like that. Mm. I like that. John chapter four, I, I love that chapter where Jesus talks with this Samaritan woman at the well. And uh, as I understand it, she was the reason he went there that through her then ministry to this entire community. And he takes his time with a conversation, responding to the questions that she raises. He's not rushing through, he's sitting there as long as it takes. Mm -hmm. Turn to this next one here, you gotta see this text in Luke 4, verse 40. As you get there, Luke 4, verse 40, it's already been a day of preaching, and that's exhausting. Casting out demons in a church, rebuking illness, and we get to this phrase right here, when the sun was setting, all those who had any, uh, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Mm -hmm. He laid his hands on every one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It's not just a pat on the back. Mm -hmm. This is a conversation. Mm -hmm. How's it been for you? Mm -hmm. It's been hard. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't tell my family what it's like because I don't want to be a burden to them. Mm. Yet Jesus, with his hand on their shoulder, listening, wiping tears out of his own eyes, out of theirs. Mm. I, I, know I, I know I could learn to live with this. I know other people have it worse than I do, but mm. I don't know how much longer I can handle it. And Jesus laying his hands on each one of them, mm. coming close, ministering to them, not rushing through it. Mm. He listens. You know this text in Hebrews 4, 15, in the King James Version. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, touched. The word is sympatheo, to sympathy. 
no feeling that we go through, he does not have an experiential grasp on. He came down and took all of our weakness upon himself and went through it. So whatever they were going through as he laid his hands upon them, which we can do in compassion, he understood what they were going through, walked through all the defilement of this earth, all the sin, and yet he himself was without sin. And that gives us power to be victorious over sin. Luke chapter 8, a few more pages onward, verse 41, thinking about Jesus who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Luke 8, verse 41. I love how we've covered different stories here. Here's another one. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Mm. Jesus, who is touched by the feeling of our infirmities, who has compassion, do you think he just said, okay, let's go to your house? <laughs> no, with his arm around him, with tears in his eyes, he understands what it's like to have a family of children who are in danger. And I believe that <laughs> Jairus was rushing and hustling as fast as he could, saying, will Jesus walk as fast as me? And it's at that point when this other woman touches the hem of his garment. We can't do all the details of the story, but immediately she is healed. And I got to believe that in that moment, she in sobs, everything in her life has changed. Mm -hmm. And Jesus stops and he has a conversation with her while Jairus is saying, wow are you doing? <laughs> okay, she's healed. Come on. And Jesus says, how's it been for you? For 12 years, it's been so hard. Mm. Mm. Your faith has made you well. At yeah. that point, verse 49, while he was still speaking, someone came to the ruler of the synagogue's house, as Jairus, saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not mm. trouble the teacher. Mm. And here's a man, like any one of us, who crumples in sobs on the ground. Mm. And Jesus doesn't just, there in verse 50, Jesus says, do not be afraid, only believe she will be made well. I don't see a Jesus standing afar off saying, come on, let's go. Mm. <laughs> he has compassion. He comes close to the people. He comes near where they are. Isaiah 53, verse 4, surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. This is what we are referring to when we talk about true medical missionary work. I talked to somebody just recently about being a medical missionary and he said, I, I get queasy at the sight of people on the operating table. A medical missionary is more than just dealing with physical ailments. And yes, we are to become knowledgeable in the natural means God has given us to preserve and, and to heal. But put simply, medical missionary work is pure unselfishness meeting the needs of people where they are, their physical needs, social needs, emotional needs, in order to bring them to Christ, the great healer, the only healer. Christ is no longer in this world physically, and so we then represent him as the true medical missionary. Three statements I want to share with you. First, in second, seventh volume of the Testimonies for the Church, page 62, we have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. Mm. Think of how inclusive this statement is. Yes. Mm. Every one of us is to be doing medical missionary work. Mm. Medical ministry, page 238 says, to take the people right where they are, whatever their position, whatever their condition, and help them in any way possible. This is gospel ministry. Mm. We begin by coming close to the people. Medical ministry, page 20, Christ stands before us as the pattern man, the great medical missionary, and an, an example to all who should come after. And what this means is that we then need to see people in the way that God sees them. Do we see them as somebody who God really loves? Or do we count them off and write them off in some way? Remember that even while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ has compassion, grace upon us. Yeah. There is no person that Jesus looks at out there and says, nope, write them off. I'm not going to go after that one. And so as we come close to the people, we minister to them as Jesus did, as a true medical missionary, seeing their needs and then asking the Lord to help us help them. Mm. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was really powerful.
I hope I can get through my lesson here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pastor James, Ryan, Shelley. It's a powerful lesson mm -hmm. because this is practical Christianity. Mm -hmm. This is where the rubber meets the road and God calls us to be his missionaries with others. I'm Jill Morricone. On Thursday, we look at greater love. Thank you, Shelley, for my lesson. The verse I have is John 15, verse 13. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life mm -hmm. for his friends. I divided the lesson in three different sections, all to me related in some fashion to love. The first section is called Compassion Fatigue, which is kind of the flip side of what you just talked about. How to love when you're weary and overwhelmed. The second part is reaching the unlovable. How to love those people you don't naturally like. And the third is loving to the limit. How can we love even at the cost of life itself? So let's start with the first one, Compassion Fatigue. How do we love when we're weary and overwhelmed? They say that compassion fatigue is described by the physical, emotional, and psychological impact of helping other people. It can occur when a nurse works in a cancer ward mm. or a pediatric cancer ward and sees little kids who are dying every day. It can occur when a teacher works with underprivileged children, when a counselor takes on the problems of others, when we're somehow overwhelmed with the need and don't know what to do about it. It could be a physical need, like a caregiver, and you're constantly ministering to someone's physical need. Mm. It could be an emotional need. Maybe you have a needy friend and you feel like you're constantly ministering to their emotional needs. Sometimes it even comes when we watch the news and we see the trauma that occurs in this world. To be honest with you, if I'm being transparent, I've experienced it the more you step into leadership, mm -hmm. the more it can seem that people ask or people want or you can start to experience that as well. Compassion fatigue is a feeling of helplessness in the face of suffering. It's feeling detached, numb, emotionally disconnected. Mm -hmm. How do we love when we're weary? or we're overwhelmed. Number one, turn toward other people's pain, not away from it. Now the natural response is to turn away. I don't want to feel it. I want to protect myself. I want to be callous. I want to insulate myself. I think of Isaiah 53 verse 3. I like this in the New Living Translation. He was despised and rejected. This is talking about Jesus, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Sometimes we want to hide from pain because it's difficult to face it squarely in the face. It's difficult to see it and we just want to turn ourselves away. Yet Psalm 34 verse 18, the Lord is near those who have a broken heart and he saves such as have a contrite spirit. God draws near to pain. He doesn't turn away from it. Mm. So the first key your natural response is to turn away, but don't do that. Turn toward pain. The second, allow God to give you sympathy for others. Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Enter into and experience the emotions of others. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And finally, number three, recognize that pain does not last forever. This world is not all there is. I think of Revelation 21 verse four, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There'll be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Mm -hmm. So if you're dealing with compassion fatigue, turn toward pain, not away from it allow God to give you sympathy for others and recognize that pain will not last forever. But how do we reach the unlovable? How do we love those who we don't naturally like? Pastor James Rafferty did a whole sermon on that. I remember that, which was incredible. We don't have time for all that. 
We're going to look at just one Bible passage. We're going to Matthew chapter 5. This is the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus has given these antithetical, contrasting statements. Remember those, like, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say don't even lust after a woman. Or you've heard that it was said do not kill someone, but I say don't even hate other people. Mm -hmm. So we see this contrasting statement here with loving those people we don't naturally like. And from it, I get four steps four steps how we can love those we don't naturally like. Number one, recognize that love is a principle, not a feeling. Mm. We're in Matthew 5, 43. Mm. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. You see, it's a command of God. Mm -hmm. First John 4, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, mm -hmm. we also ought to love one another. Mm -hmm. It's not optional. It's not whether we feel like it. God simply says, you are called, Jill, to love other people and love specifically those people that you don't naturally like. Remember this, I love this, and I try to think about it when I find and come up against somebody that you haven't rubbed with. If you were able to see everything that that person has been through in their life, you wouldn't help but be able to love them as Jesus does. Mm. In other words, if you could see their baggage, if you could see their pain, if you could see their past, if you could see their insecurities, if you could see what they struggle with, all those things we hide from other people, mm -hmm. you'd be led to see, oh wow, I have more love and compassion for them. Mm. Recognize that love is a principle, not a feeling. Number two, speak with kindness. I say to you, we're still in Matthew 5, 44. Love your enemies, that's the command, love. And then it says, bless those who curse you. Our natural response is to respond with hate or irritation or negativity or criticism or judgment or the cold shoulder treatment. Instead, we're to react with kindness. Again, this is a principle, not a feeling. Mm -hmm. We don't have to feel kind to speak kind. Mm -hmm. It's a principle. Next, number three, we act with goodness. Keep going to Matthew 5, 44. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you that speak with kindness. Do good to those who hate you. You know, they say actions, they speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. And there's truth in that. We could say, oh yes, and I could speak kind words to you. But yeah, if my actions don't follow, you would doubt the words, would you not? And you'd say, well, I'm not sure if Jill really meant that because her actions don't follow that. Again, when we think about actions, this is a choice. This is a principle. It's not based on a feeling to act kindly or well toward other people. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians 13. It says, love suffers long and is kind. These are actions of love. Love does not envy. It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And finally, number four, going back to Matthew 5, verse 44, we pray for those that we don't like. Mm -hmm. So we love our enemies, that's the command from God. We bless those, in other words, we speak kindly to them. We do good to them. We follow up the kind words with actions. And then we pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And finally, how do we love to the limit? How do we love at the cost of love, life itself? There's no way that we can do that except following the example of Jesus. Jesus demonstrated, God demonstrated his own love for us, mm -hmm. Romans 5, 8. And that while we were still sinners, yet even now sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. We can only love because Christ puts his love in our hearts mm -hmm. and in our lives. Who is God calling you to love today? Who is in your community, your home that he wants you to love? We have our challenge on Thursday. Learn about others in your community. It could be foreigners, it could be refugees, it could be non-Christians, people of another culture. Find unreached people groups in your own community. 
And then the challenge up is to identify one specific person. So it doesn't have to be this grand thing. We have to go to the whole world. Identify one person that God wants you to pray for. God wants you to reach out for. God wants you to meet their needs, as Ryan talked about. God wants you to have compassion on. God wants you to love. And then you can introduce them to Jesus. Amen. Oh, thank you, Jill. And thank you for covering the challenge because the challenge is how we take the knowledge that we are learning here and put it into practice. And that's what this is all about. I feel that this has been such a beautiful study. We've mm -hmm. got a saying that we've had church, but we've got just a moment for a quick final thought from each person. Amen. You know, the text that comes to my mind is Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and onward. It says, uh, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the God we serve, a loving, kind, compassionate Lord. And as we've learned today, He is the one we're seeking. He's the one we're trying to implement and to be like. And those are the, He is the person that we're supposed to be projecting for the world to see in us. Amen. You know, we're all immigrants and refugees really as Christians and believers, pilgrims and strangers here. And Jesus himself became an immigrant to planet Earth from heaven. He became a refugee as we read there in his early story. And to be a Christian, to be like Christ, we should have more sympathy and more understanding with immigrants, with refugees, and therefore reach out to them and encourage them to look to a better world. What would you give to spend an hour with Jesus? Mm. When we minister to the needy, we are interacting directly with Jesus. Matthew 25, 40. Then the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I tell you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. Amen. First John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death to life mm. because we love the brethren. Mm. You know if you are truly converted in, in Jesus, if you have love for those around you. Mm. Amen. amen and amen. And just remember that we can all be stretcher bearers. The faith of friends uh, is so important. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need a stretcher bearer and other times we can be one. Well, we hope you have enjoyed this wonderful lesson, Mission to the Needy. And next week we will continue and we're going to go from Mission to the Needy mm -hmm. to Mission to the Powerful. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes that can be more difficult mm -hmm. than the earlier. So. What our prayer is for you is that you'll join us next week, that the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you always.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, PIC. Happy Sabbath. How's your week? Maybe some of us are tired or worried about something, but uh, today is Sabbath day, so we need to forget those worries and focus our hearts and minds to Jesus again and happy Sabbath. But before we start our singing or this Sabbath school, let us bow our head for the word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, we would like to thank you and adore you for giving this special day, which is Sabbath day, to each of every one of us. And also, Lord, thank you for the blessings that we receive throughout the week. And as we sing songs of praises, may you glorify thee and forgive us for all the sins that we committed against thee. In Christ's name we pray, in the loving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So for our first song, let us sing, Heart is the Shepherd, Voice I Hear. Our second song, let us sing Take My Life and Let It Be.
To continue our worship, let us all rise and sing, Hark, this the shepherd's voice I hear. We invite everyone to please stand for our opening song. Those who are able, please kneel as we pray. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we praise you for the Sabbath day that you've given unto us. Thank you, dear Lord, for guiding us and giving us a blessing throughout this week. And as we started our, our program this morning, dear Lord, may you guide us. May your Holy Spirit be upon us, dear Lord. And forgive us for all our sin that we com committed against thee. In the loving name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath to our live and online worshipers. And welcome to Philippine International Church. May I invite everyone to please greet your neighbors a happy Sabbath. There. As we begin our Sabbath worship this morning, I would like to remind you with a verse found in Genesis 2, verse 2 to 3. It says here, And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. May we all be blessed and rest in God's presence as we worship and praise him this Sabbath day. God bless us all.
Happy Sabbath, PIC! And to our friends around the world, today, let's ponder on the topic of stewardship. What is stewardship? Miriam Webster defines stewardship as the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. In the pen of Sister White, she wrote, Stewardship is our recognition of the sovereignty of God, of His ownership of all things, and of the bestowal of His grace upon us. It is included in the proper understanding of the principles of stewardship. So let me share with you the four biblical principles of stewardship. First is ownership. God the Father has absolute rights of ownership over all things. It is written in 1 Chronicles 29 verses 11 to 12. It says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. To us Christians, stewardship means we treat everything as it is God's. Everything is ultimately God's creation. Do you agree? Second, responsibility. Romans 14, 12 says, Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Have you ever been shown radical generosity from someone? Like, imagine... A friend invites you and your family to stay several weeks in his spacious, perfectly decorated, and immaculately clean five-star hotel. You are blown. Blown away by your friend's, uh, friend's love and generosity. When it, when it comes time to check out, the question is, will you seek to leave the place messy? Things will be scattered everywhere or might you even leave it better than you found it because of His amazing grace. So the principle of responsibility means we feel the weight, the weight of God's generosity and respond with thoughtful care, development, and pure enjoyment of the many gifts He's allowed us to manage. Third principle, accountability. Luke 12, verse 48 says, For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. Also in Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his deeds. God has individually, individually blessed us with resources. We cannot shift our stewardship responsibility to others. He has made us individual stewards, and we are accountable to Him. The story of the Meadows Mites is a short account in the Bible of Jesus making an observation. That exemplifies stewardship, that regardless of how much someone possesses, Fourth principle, rewards. While a steward is a manager, a superintendent, a servant, a caretaker, the designation is used only in response to what God has given him. So we become good Christian stewards not because we want to be saved, but we are saved because Christ first saved us. It is God who first does great things for us, giving us life, wealth, health, and everything. We only respond to His goodness. Therefore, whatever a steward does is His natural task to be faithful to God. And if we are faithful, Christ will one day soon say us, Well done! Thou faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Christian stewardship has rewards. 
First, the future words of commendation from master, our master teacher, faithful servant. Secondly, there will be a heavenly home. And lastly, eternal life, a life long tenancy. Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24 says, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. So this Sabbath day, we invited an ordinary member of our church to share how this principle, the four principles of stewardship, is manifested in his daily walk as a Christian. Happy Sabbath, PIC. I am Jeffrey De La Cruz, an irregular third-year self-supporting student, a major in BS physical education. When I came to EUP, I have no money, but I have this, this desire to study. I pray to the Lord to help me find means for me to survive. God did not give me money. Instead, He allowed me to meet people in campus who need their houses to be repaired. I accepted different kinds of jobs like carpentry, car repair, electrical works, welding, and more. Doing all this job to survive, I learned that I have these special skills. I have talents in doing repairs. God did not give me money. He gave me talents and skills to earn money. Since God gave me these talents, I always make sure to give all my best. I become meticulous. I become honest in doing my work. I put, I put my heart in every furniture I make. I always consider that this is not just to earn a living for my tuition fee, but this work is my return gift to God for giving me these skills, these talents to me. According to the law 12, verse 48 says, when, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. This text reminds me that when God gave me these talents that I have, He also gave me a responsibility. I should use it to give glory to Him. PIC Church Door in Tights Rock are some examples of my works that God has allowed me to finish. This is my gift to him. I am happy to do something for the church. Yes, I am paid to do this, doing this diligently, meticulously, with all honesty in my gift to him. I cannot make a second-rate work because God is my master carpenter. I am happy to discover these talents the Lord has entrusted me. Because of this, I have survived in EUP. I have money for food, tuition fee, and sometimes 
I also have extra for Cologne. I'm just really enjoy to have these talents by seeing finished products. When I see that my teacher is happy to sleep on the day bed and made, I am happy. It gives me a sense of purpose and inspiration to be more creative and hardworking. Finally, it is my prayer that the Lord will give me more project that is charge related. Also, I do not charge much. I just work and let people give according to how much they can afford. After my graduation, I will be a teacher. I am planning to become a missionary teacher. If he will assign me somewhere, I can also be utilized to help our mission schools facility repaired and in place because of this talent. I want to use this God-given talents for him to make our mission schools well kept to serve our students better. I am Jeffrey De La Cruz, a student carpenter, soon a missionary teacher. I am God stewards. Happy Sabbath. May I call on the Sabbath school teachers to proceed the assigned area. So I would like to ask the Sabbath school teachers to stand wherever you are, and I would like the congregations to give silent as we pray. So let us pray. Our, our gracious Heavenly Father, you are loving and kindness. At this moment, we pray, O oh Lord, and we ask your Holy Spirit to guide us in our Sabbath school lesson review. Lord Jesus, guide the teachers and members, sustain them the wisdom that they needed. Forgive and forget our sins, O oh Lord. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sabbath school, I'm sorry there's a, a mistaken uh, announcement. It's not classes, but it's a panel discussion. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, PIC, and to all our on, online worshipers. Um, this program, this Sabbath school program, we specially re requested our Sabbath school coordinator to have this lesson review discussion because apparently this is a culmination program of one of our classes in development communication, which is the mass media evangelism class under Dr. Juvi Batrai. And this lesson, actually lesson eight, is we made this as our culmination program since of course in two weeks time, we are nearing to our end of semester and we have to secure a slot in PIC to have this culmination program and praise God that we secured this date and, this, and we are going to discuss today lesson number eight. So for everyone's knowledge, 
Uh, the mass media evangelism class of the AUP Development Communication has been conducting a weekly lesson review discussion. And we are airing it live every Friday at 5.30 p.m. in our Facebook page, Banghai Linya Para Sayo. But, it's, but it is also being shared in our official Facebook pages of our institution, the Adventist University of the Philippines, Facebook page, and other social media pages related to AUP. So if you still want to discuss with us every Friday at 5.30 p.m., by the way, our guests, the guests that I have been um, discussing with every Friday are all AUPians. So if you want to hear them share their insights about our lesson to, to see how AUPians really have their fair share and a very deep insights about the lesson, you could support us by... Um, I mean, by watching us every Friday at 5.30 p.m. in our Facebook pages. Again, Banghai Linya Para Sayo. And, and of course, I want to acknowledge the presence of my dear friend here, Job, who has been one of our guests. I think this is the third time now that you have been guesting. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, we had the first um, uh, review on the very first time Banghai Linya Para Sayo had this program, and I am so blessed. I am with Caleb Blumink at the time, and I am fortunate to be invited today, and I am looking forward to the lessons that we're going to share. Yes, thank you, Job. And Job has been so patient to us since, of course, the lesson review discussion every week that started, I think, um, two months ago. It's just the, I mean, like the try palang. Trial, it's just a trial and error part on our side since this is the first ever time that our um, class conducted a lesson review. So, my friend Job is very patient and praise God that God has been teaching us, guiding us every week on how we could better our productions. So, if you want to still study with us, we have another production on Friday. We, we are going to live our lesson number nine. But then again, of course, since this is our lesson eight, we are going to delve deeper on, on our topic Mission to the needy, but Joe, of course, before we uh, dissect this lesson and give practical ways, let us first uh, for our PIC um, worshipers and online worshipers, let us um, bow down for a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, it is with grateful heart that we come to you this morning, worshiping you and praising you, Father, for you have given given us a very restful Sabbath, Lord. I pray that may this Sabbath School uh, lesson review discussion uh, be acceptable in your presence and may all the words that, we've, that we will be sharing this morning be uh, something that came from you. And Lord, please help us to reflect more on what you want us to do to those uh, people who are in need of help. Thank you, Father, for being with us. And thank you, Father, for always um, taking care of us and guiding us all throughout this week. Thank you, Father, and we ask all these things in the loving name of our precious Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Brother Jove, our lesson this week um, highlighted the fact that most of the stories in the Bible circle around Jesus teaching us to help those people in need, right? But one of the ministry of Jesus when he came down to Lupa um, years ago, is not just to, of course, proclaim the gospel, um, have people to follow him, but also have uh, one of Christ's ministry is to help those people who are in need. And throughout those stories in the gospels, makikita natin how intentional Jesus is when he is helping those people. We could see how Jesus would personally go to that place just to help those person that he knows is in need. It may be a physical need, a mental need, but we know that Jesus has been so intentional in helping and, all, and we could see that Jesus also wants us to do the same thing. So, of course, guys, for your knowledge, our lesson review discussion that we have been doing every week we do not, um, we are not very leaning on the theological part. Most of our discussions are very practical and we have sets of questions, which is, we are going to do now, Joe. 
So before we delve in our question, Job, do you want to give like a context or a background about our lesson? Well, our lesson is very straightforward. It is mission to the needy. And then there's two words that we should look into. Mission. Is this something that we are responsible? Is this something that we are, uh, we should do? And I think our lesson will explain more of that. If this is really a responsibility of all of us, or if it's just a responsibility of those who are capable, or, or for those who are people who are rich, per se. And this lesson gives us light if the, the help that we're going to give is just limited to physical assistance. You know, in our lesson, we, we can see that there are many, many needs of the people who we can meet as missionaries. We are going to be missionaries to those people who are needy, not just financially, but here we can see that there are people who need our affection, who needs our time, who needs probably the people that we know. And it's not only limited to physical assistance. So I think we will dig deeper into that on our, uh, as we go by. Yes, thank you, Job. And also, if we are to read our lesson eight, it is divided into two parts. The lesson is um, telling us that there are people who there are two kinds of people who are in need of help. The first one is that our friends or the closer peers, our, our, our circle. There are a lot of people in our circle which unknowingly are in need of help. And another, the lesson is telling us that there are those who are outside our circle who are also in need of our help. And they could be the refugees, the immigrants, or basically just those people who are suffering and needs assistance on our, uh, from our part. So Jove, before, so Jove, of course, since the lesson is divided into two parts, we are going to uh, share our practical lessons on the first part about our friend. Because in our story, we saw the lesson... Uh, we saw the story of the paralytic man and his friends. We know the story that the paralytic man, of course, since he is paralyzed, he can physically walk to Jesus so that he could say, Jesus, please heal me. Right? So what his friends did is that, of course, since Jesus that time is with a lot of people, they cannot go across the crowd just to get to Jesus. So, what his friends did is that they climbed through the roof and dun nila binaba ang kanilang friend who is a paralytic. And just for, his, just for their friend to see and be healed by Jesus. So, we could learn a lot of lessons from that story, right, Job? So, my question to you, my dear partner, is that how important it is to have friends who help you in your spiritual walk and how can we be that kind of friends to friend to rather yeah you know what as as i was looking into that story in it is actually found in luke 5 17 to 26 if you have your bibles you can scan through it and then you will learn that some of the men who bring one of their friends to jesus to be healed you know they were so persistent they did not gave up immediately when they were faced with difficulties. Their difficulties is that there are many of people. It was crowded. And the only way they can bring that paralytic man to Jesus is to rip off the roof and then drop their paralytic friend. You know, if it is necessary for them to break through the roof to take him to Jesus, they will do it. And then they, they will just... Uh, and then in their thinking, there will be time to fix the damage later. You know, I was... As I was reflecting on this, you know, sometimes I am also uh, guilty of this. Before we help people, we sometimes assess how much damage will this require of me. You know, before we help, we, th we think first of ourselves. And that I think that limits so much of our ability to help someone. Because instead of helping that someone first, we think of ourselves first. And I think that's something we can learn from this story. These men helped their friends and they even thought of ripping the roof and then let's just fix it later. Let's first help our friend. Because no, this is just a roof. Our friend is paralytic and this is the only hope that he has. And sometimes, you know, it takes for us to go the extra mile. 
you know, having friends, you know, the question going back, how important it is to have friends who will help you in your spiritual walk. You know, having friends who support you in your spiritual journey is crucial. It's very important because sometimes we just, you know, cave off. You know, we don't want people to know that we're spiritually down already. And as Christians, having these friends who will help us in our spiritual walk is very important. You know, it is highlighted in the story. You know, these friends were persistent and went beyond conventional measures to ensure their companions' well-being. You know, some friends of us, they just want to be alone sometimes, but us, we just want to accommodate that. But what if this person, for example, I don't know with you, Sister Kyla, if you are spiritually down, do you just hide off and you don't want people to visit you? Or you're just waiting for other people to visit you? And then some people, like me, I'm thinking that I will not visit you because you might not want to be visited. But I was not trying to visit you. You know, sometimes we have to do the extra mile. But if this person, uh, uh, this person's response is not to accept that or to accept Jesus, it should not stop us to help this person. And I think that is very important. And additionally, additionally, we should follow Jesus' example. It is not just for us to help them with their immediate needs, but to help them. We should help them and invite them to follow Jesus, you not know, to that ultimate provider, you not know, sharing the source of eternal life. You know, in special cases, there are refugees who suffer. I don't know, in biblical times, there are very few people who suffered, you know, uh, multiple people displaced in, in another place probably Israelites, but the, you cannot see it very common compared to now. Now, we should make special effort. You know, when I was in the States, before uh, they, we attended this ASI convention, and they call this a pre-ASI convention event, and I was with my choir, Sola Gratia, and we, uh, when, we went to the, when we went to the place, it was three days prior to the ASI convention, they had this pre assi uh, event, which is uh, headed by uh, uh, door, uh, something about door beyond. Uh, the door, uh, the next door, something. And it's, and it's a mission to those people who are di displaced. And in the States, you can see a lot of people coming from you know, Syria, you have African people, you have other people coming from different countries who are just in one uh, community and then they are displaced. They don't have work. They don't have people to provide for them. And then our church, through this ministry, you know, had a uh, program for their kids to, uh, to teach them uh, about Jesus. And in this very special way, I can see that these people had a glimpse of hope. And I think that's very important in our helping uh, the, those in need. Even though we cannot provide them with their immediate needs, I think the time that we are giving them, if that gives them hope, I think that is more than enough. And if we are capable, we can go the extra mile, but to make ourselves available to their needs, I think that is the first step that we can give and we can do. And also, I want to add, since our uh, first question, again, it's a flash on the screen, how important it is to have friends who help you in your spiritual walk. It is very important in a sense that, of course, if you are surrounded by those kinds of people, at some point, Brother Jove, you also absorb that same energy, right? Kumbaga, if you are, kumbaga, syempre, if you are spiritually weak, if you, if you have days wherein you just feel that, you just feel so down, and you are surrounded with people whose energy, kumbaga, whose vibes, kumbaga, in a layman's term, I nagradiate of positivity, de ba? In that sense, grab yung magiging attraction mo to that same kind of energy too, right? So being surrounded by those people who have who has a very good spirituality is very vital because it also recharges us. It also navigates us more to Jesus. And how can we be that kind of friend to others? Practically, kahit so simple ways lamang natin, we could chat them, right, Brother Job? If we saw some of their shared posts being Oh, it's 
be, lately it has been so heavy o kaya naman they shared a post about um, how hard it is to be in college per se so maybe we could comment to that post and say oh or have a friend in me or maybe we could personally message that person and say that oh maybe I could pray for you can I call for a sec right there are a lot of practical ways especially now that, that now that we are in this generation we could really do a lot of things for our friends no matter where they are exactly and I just want to quote a Bible verse from Galatians 6 verse 2 Galatians 6 verse, so I will be reading it in the New King James Version. It reads, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I think, you know, as Christians, we should make it our personal mission to bear each other's burdens. That should be a responsibility of each one of us. And that should not be a burden to us to help someone. Because to carry each other's burdens, it helps us to fulfill the law of Christ, which is to love your enemy, to love your friends, and to love them just as how God loves us. And I think, you know, if we have that in our hearts, we can bring more people to Christ. That's true, that's And I true. think that's the main point and the main essence of our lesson, helping others, being there in their times of needs. Us imitating Jesus Christ's mission here on earth is us bringing to them the message of Jesus Christ and bringing them to Jesus Christ, the ultimate provider of everything. And I think, you know, this week we had the stewardship emphasis week. And we are to be stewards, not just of the material things we have, but also to those people God provided to us. That is extending to our families, to our friends, to the community around us, and even to those people who, do, who doesn't share the same beliefs that we have. It is not limited to those people who we share beliefs with. Even if their response to Jesus may vary, it should not stop us with our mission. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Amen, Brother Joe. And now we are going to delve deeper in our second question, right? Since in our first question, we talked about how we can be of great help to our friends. Now, this is the harder part of the lesson since this goes beyond our circle already. Brother Job, what are the practical ways that we could do naman, to help those people who are in dire need of help, especially those refugees, right? Our immigrants, maybe our international friends here in AUP, and those who are kumbaga, severely suffering na at this point of time. And what Aside from telling us what are the practical ways that we could do them, what should be our motivation as well in helping them? Brother Joe? Okay, I've listed a few. I've listed a few. And this is only because I have experienced this. Um, first thing I've written here is understanding and empathy. So what is empathy? First, you have to uh, understand what this means. You know, empathy is the, our ability or the ability to understand and share the feelings of another person. It is not just knowing, but understanding and sharing the feelings of another person. It involves the capacity to emotionally connect with someone. So you have to con connect with them emotionally and perceive and comprehend their emotions. Basically, it is to respond with compassion. You know, empathy goes beyond its sister word, sympathy. You know, sympathy is just a feeling of pity, sorrow for someone's situation. It is just you, you know, I'm sorry for you, my friend. But empathy goes beyond that. Instead, it involves putting oneself in another's shoes, in one person's shoes, experiencing the world from their perspective. You know, where do they come from? Why do they react like this? Why are they so uh, sensitive? Probably if we become more empathy empathetic, we will understand and responding with understanding and care. I think this is very important. It is a fundamental aspect of human connection, and it plays a crucial role in building relationships. And for us Christians, it is a very crucial role for us to build a healthy community as believers of Christ. It is fostering compassion and promoting a sense of community. You know, what practical action we can do is, probably we should take time, 
Now step back before being reactive to someone's needs. Take time to step back. Understand first where they are coming from. Whether it is material assistance that they need. Because sometimes you just think, oh, I'll just hand off money. Probably money is not the need. Probably they need more than that. Understand first where they are coming from. If they need language support or emotional support, you can better help them if you understand where they're coming from. Right, but, uh, Sister Kyla? And our motivation for this, as part of the question, it should be empathy. Empathy should be our motivation and realizing that each individual situation is unique. And genuine understanding fosters effective assistance. Understanding it, can help us better respond to their needs. Another thing is, that is my number one, um, number one practical step is understanding I, I and empathy. I want to add something about your sure. number one point, Brother Joe. Okay. Since, of course, empathy is something that, uh, that is cultivated <laughs> in, a, in a character of a person, and it, it takes a lot of experiences, a lot of knowledge for a person to be an empath. A person who has empathy is an empath, right? If, if we think we are sort of not an empath, maybe what we could do is to just be aware. Open our eyes. Because in opening our eyes to other people's realities, we could see a lot more than... We could see more that, that God would reveal to us about their needs, right? Yeah. And actually, during the week of prayer, as I was working with our fine arts uh, students, I realized that some of them are, you know, because we were working uh, the whole night, and then they're saying, Kuya Jove, I have to leave early because I have a work to do by 7 a.m. And you look at that, you know, these people are doing so much for God, and then by the next day, they have to wake up early at 7 a.m. because they have to work. And then some people, you know, if they are late, you know, they... Um, because they are late going to the call time. He said, oh, we'll have to be in PIC by 6 p.m. this afternoon. But they arrive 8 p.m. Sometimes you're so, ah, why are they late? I'm here for two hours. But you didn't know that they come from working. And they're so tired. And you, you just came fresh from home. You just had your bath. You just had your dinner. For them, they haven't eaten yet. They haven't had their, um, they even have taking a bath and then they smell mm -hmm. and then if if and only if we can be more empathetic mm -hmm. we will understand where they're coming from and we can be more uh, responsive to their needs and we can understand them more you know the second thing I have here Sister Kyla is attending to their immediate needs you know what can be our practical action to this mm -hmm. you know sometimes we can provide them tangible assistance well most of the times this is what we do we provide them tangible assistance within our capabilities. Okay, that's very important. Providing assistance within your capabilities, such as offering shelter, probably if you have an extra room for them, food, or connecting, the, connecting them with relevant sources. Sometimes we cannot provide, yeah. but we know of someone who might, who can provide. So we can connect them to that someone, and it's just one call away. You know, sometimes pinagkakait pa natin. You know, our motivation should be: we reflect on the nature of Jesus by attending to their immediate needs with a sincere desire to make a positive impact to their lives. And I think this could make a very big difference to those people who are in need. Well, I have another one. Okay, number three building trust. This is, I think this is very important. We have to earn the trust of that person that we are about to approach or we are about to help. By approaching them with kindness, respect, even though they are very simple or even if we don't understand what they are uh, feeling right now, we have to respect that. We should not invalidate their feelings. I think this is very common in our age right now. You're invalidating my feelings. You don't understand me. I think if we approach them with kindness first and then respect their feelings, of course, if we don't understand it, we should respect it. And a genuine interest in their well-being. If you 
uh, make them feel that you have genuine interest to their well-being and you really want to help them, they will trust you. And then they will understand your help. And pointing them to Jesus Christ would be more easy because they understood that you are not there for just that agenda alone. Because sometimes when we help people, we want them, you know, during evangelistic meeting, we go to communities, we help them, we have community service, but they understand that at the end of the week, they, you want them to be baptized. You just want to give them food, you just want to give them medical mission. But if you don't really care, they will know, and then they will not trust you. Even though how much money you put in that evangelistic meeting, if they don't see your genuine care, it will never be effective. You know, our motivation should be, we build trust not for personal gain, but as a foundation for meaningful assistance and ultimately for introducing them to the hope found in Jesus. That's true, that's true. Amen and amen. And also to answer our question again for number two, what are the practical ways that we could do to help our, kumbaga, those people outside our circle, the refugees, the immigrants, and others. But before I answer that, to give you a context, guys, in the Bible, we know that Jesus is also an immigrant, right? Jesus, when he is still a baby, they have to flee from Egypt because if not, Jesus would be killed, right? And also, they faced a lot of challenges. Since we know immigrating to another or emigrating to another land also means that you are to face a new environment also means that you are to face a new language also means that you have to face a new culture a new set of people and a, a whole lot or a whole uh, different experience and we know that if we are in that situation, that we are to adjust in that situation, it would really take a long time, a very hard kumbaga, endeavors para ma-overcome natin at fully makasettle tayo on that place. And so for our fourth practical way on how we could be of help to those people, because if we are to put it in the context of our institution in AUP, it could be our friends from Mindanao, our friends from Visayas, or from or our friends from other countries. Sometimes they have a very hard time adjusting in AUP because of in AUP our language is different from theirs. In AUP, there is a set of social norms or cultures that is, uh, that is already constructed that is different from theirs. So, a lot of, most of the times, I know you guys are experiencing this, especially our international friends, you have a hard time feeling included in that new environment. So, for our friends here who are um, um, discussing with us now, I hope we could make them feel included and I hope we could also make them feel that they could also collaborate with us. For our practical action, Brother Joe, for, for this um, uh, fourth um, point, we could recognize and embrace diversity. Of course, how boring it would be if our community is just composed of people with uniformity, people with the same character, people with just who walks the same, right? So let's embrace diversity because kumaga, oh, yung alaging sinasabi, there is beauty in diversity. There is truly beauty in diversity. After all, all of those people are children of God. And let us embrace the fact that um, I mean, let us um, deal with the fact that they, that they are having a hard time adjusting to our environment. So what we could do is make them feel included. Let us not make them feel na, um, parang mahirap naman makipag-usap sa'yo. It is very hard to, um, conversing with you, so I'll just not talk with you. I'll just not um, deal with you. I'll just not help you. And also, sabi dito, let us make special efforts to understand cultural differences. And what should our motivation be, Brother Job? Let us cultivate a spirit of inclusivity and collaboration. Acknowledging that everyone, regardless of background, deserves compassionate support. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And also, another, another point, our fifth point of the practical ways that we could do to help those people in need is 
a prayer for divine guidance. What can we do? Let us prioritize prayer, of course, because sometimes when we are helping, diba, there is a danger in helping than Brother Jove. Na parang, when we are helping, probably there could be a paradigm shift in our mindset na, oh, I am helping a lot of people. I am very, ano, I am very philanthropic. I am very helpful. I am a very helpful person. Sometimes, my danger when we are very helpful person then, na probably it take credit natin, all the things that we are doing. So, what we could do for our fifth point is that, let us always pray to God. After all, we are just vessels of Jesus Christ. What we are doing to another people, the love that we are sharing to another people, the blessings that we are sharing to those in need are all from Jesus Christ, are all from God. So let us always pray. Let us always say, Lord, please may the motivation of our heart only be uh, you, the love that comes from you. And sabi dito nga, our motivation, let love be the driving force behind your actions. Praying for wisdom to extend kindness and care in a manner that reflects the teachings of Jesus. And also, a lot of times, um, sometimes then, Brother Jove, hindi natin nakikita na, oh, there are a lot of people who are in need of help. So, what we could do is, let us pray, guys. Let us pray, Lord, direct me this day to the people who are in need of my prayer. To those people who are in need of my pagkamusta. To those people who are in need of probably assistance man lang, kahit educational na pag-assist, right? So let us pray always that God would lead us to those people. And also, Brother Joe pala, uh, I want to add na, alam niyo ba, yesterday, Brother Joe, I attended a workshop that is, um, I mean, collaborated rather by NYC and UNICEF. And a lot of people, and we are, I am with my 25 colleagues there. And most of them, when they are sharing their story, they came from a background, of a, a depressive background. They have been battling with a mental health problems before. And then they read an article that volunteerism could help you alleviate, um, kahit kuwaga, konti man lang yung iyong nararamdaman na negative feeling. So what they did is that, kaya nga nakasama namin, is that they tried to join organizations. Organizations as advocacies are to help those people in their communities. And by experience, they, ex by experience, they learned that by volunteerism, by volunteering to um, a certain cause, by helping those who are in need, at some point, in one way or another, it also helps their mental health. So there is also blessing in helping other people. Aside from the fact that you're helping them, you are also helping yourself, <laughs> right? And lastly, that we could do a practical way that we could do to help those people in need is of course after a series of helping them but before of course I introduce this sixth point I wanna first make a disclaimer that I hope um, our intention of helping people is out of love and not because we just want them to be baptized because that's also the danger of helping other people. Sometimes you have this intention that after all of our series, all after the series of helping them, we want them, kumbaga, we expect them to uh, repay it by babda being baptized, okay, or repay it by doing something naman for our own gain. So that's the danger of... Um, I'm expecting that that is what you could get from helping other people. So for our sixth point, our practical way is that we could introduce them to Jesus. Because sometimes, guy, more than the physical, guys, or, or for our only worshipers, more than the physical aspect, more than the mental aspect, there are a lot of people in this, probably in this congregation, who wants to know Jesus more? And they are just so shy to approach someone, maybe because uh, they have this um, preconceived ideas about it. But let us take the first step to introduce Jesus to them. Introduce Jesus to them not in a way that would um, yun nga, make them feel na love. That you're very doctrinal, naman, very theological. Wag naman ganun agad, guys. Let us first introduce Jesus 
Our um, friends, Jesus is very beautiful. Jesus is, um, kumbaga, if we see, if we know him more, we could see that Jesus really deserves to be loved, and the love that came from him it's very um, soothing in a sense. So, I in a practical action for this sixth part, in moments of trust and connection, when, when we already gave the trust and connection to those people whom we are helping, share the message of Jesus. Offering spiritual support if they are, of course, open to it. And our motivation, of course, Brother Jove, in um, um, introducing Jesus to them is that it should be rooted, again, rooted in love. Aiming not just to alleviate immediate needs, but also to guide them toward a deeper and eternal source of hope found in Jesus Christ. Amen to that, Sister Kyla. I think I'm... No, I hope that all of us have learned something from this lesson. There are many points that we have shared to you. But the bottom line is, you know, in giving help, we should be driven by empathy. We should see where they're coming from. We should understand them. And we should be motivated by genuine love. We should be guided with the desire to make a positive impact on both immediate and spiritual dimensions of their lives. And I think... This is very important, Sister Kyla, in helping. When we help, think first. Understand their need before even thinking of what, what, what this help I'm offering, what will this entail to me? And I think thinking first of some others, uh, of people's needs, more than your needs, is what Jesus wants us to do. And what, what Jesus wants us to focus in is that in imitating Jesus, we should be driven by love, compassion. And these acts of benevolence are encouraged to spring from genuine love. Love should be always our motivation. This should prompt us with a heartfelt desire to assist others. The guidance suggested, suggests incorporating prayer for divine guidance. When approaching those in need, Sister Kyla, we should ensure that actions are not only driven by love, but also it is directed by a higher purpose, which is to lead them to Jesus. Amen and amen. So you also want, can you also give your appeal now, or that's your appeal? Yeah, I think that's my appeal. Okay, so before Brother Jove close this discussion, this panel discussion with a prayer, I want to read a passage from Mrs. White's book, The Youth's Instructor, written in 1903. It says here, Seize every opportunity to contribute to the happiness of those around you, sharing with them your affection. It all says here, words of kindness, looks of sympathy, expression of appreciation. Would to many a struggling, a struggling, lonely one to be, lonely one be as a cup of cold water to a thirsty soul. It also says here, a word of cheer, an acts of kindness would go far to lighten the burdens that are resting heavily upon weary shoulders. It is in unselfish ministry that true happiness is found. Brother Job, it's very beautiful, right? And every word indeed of such service is recorded, of course, in the books of heaven as done to Christ. Live in the sunshine of Christ's love then your influence will bless the world. Amen. Thank you for that, Sister Kyla. And I hope and pray that as we, uh, as we travel through or as we live day by day, may we see the needs of our brethren and may we not turn a blind eye on that because this is our mission to help those who are in need. I invite everyone to bow their heads for prayer. Let us pray. Our dear compassionate Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We'd like to pause for a moment in recognition for your glory and grace in our lives. Oh Lord, thank you for this lesson. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that we are not only stewards to the physical things that we own, but also we are stewards of our brothers and sisters, stewards of their needs. Oh Lord, please help us. Help us to see what they need through your eyes. And may it be, Father, that we'll have a heart with a desire to help them rooted in love and to help them, O oh Lord, help us to bring them closer to you and may it be, Father, that you will work in us 
that this help that we are going to extend in our community be a help, be a genuine help that will bring them closer to you, the ultimate source and provider of everything. This is all we ask. In the loving name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. Of course, Brother Joe, before we go down, since you have one more minute left, I want to invite everyone to support our ministry, uh, the Ministry of AUP Development Communication, specifically the Mass Media Evangelism class under Dr. Juvi Batray. Our ministry is, of course, this, since this is technically our um, culmination program, the Lesson 8, but we also have series of Lesson Pa every Friday. But then again, I want to invite everyone to support our ministry, the Banghai Linya Para Sayo, Tala Chapter, lesson, Re lesson Review Discussion, every Friday at 5.30 p.m. If you can find our Facebook page, you can visit AUP page, the Adventist University of the Philippines Facebook page because it is also being shared there. Every Again, every Friday at 5.30 p.m. And that's all. And happy Sabbath, PIC, and to our online worshipers. Thank you, Brother Joe. Hello. For our closing song, we invite everyone to stand and let us sing, I Will Go. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this Sabbath day that you've given to us to rest and to find peace in you. Thank you, Lord, for um, protecting us throughout this week. Lord, I also thank you for um, this Sabbath school lesson, lesson Lord. Continue to guide us um, in our calling for you um, to meet the needs of all people, Lord, even though we don't know when or if they will ever um, accept Jesus as their personal Savior. Lord, um, give us the courage um, to take the first step in humbling ourselves, Lord, to uh, make friends and to love those in need, Lord. And always remind us of your promise in John 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. Lord, as we continue this week, I pray, Lord, that we may be able to reflect Jesus in our life and um, continue to show love to the people around us, especially to those in need. All this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
morning and happy Sabbath to all of you. Before we proceed to our hour of worship, I'd like to uh, give a, a time to our beloved president to make uh, an official uh, statement. Good morning and happy Sabbath to our beloved AUP community who are here now at PIC and also to our uh, online viewers. I would like to make a statement about the November 21 incident that happened at our main gate. I want to share with you the, the first official statement that we released, which I believe most of you have read. But nevertheless, I want to reiterate that statement today. An incident occurred at the main gate of the Adventist University of the Philippines at past 3 a.m. on November 21, 2023. Two agency security guards were victims of a senseless act of violence. The matter is currently under investigation by police authorities. Based on the initial information, it is an isolated case and has nothing to do with anyone directly connected to the university nor with its daily operations. Please be assured that the safety and well-being of our students, faculty, and staff are our top priority. Let us come together as a community to pray for the Lord's guidance, comfort, and protection. Let us pray for the bereaved families. That's our first official statement, which we allowed any one of you who has access to it to share to the public. And yesterday, we posted our second press release and I want to share with you as well. The university administration received a report on the ongoing investigation from Lieutenant Colonel Louis Gonzaga, Chief of Police of Silang Cavite. We were apprised that the suspect had been identified and the case was already filed at the prosecutor's office. We express our gratitude to Silang Municipal Police Station for their swift and relentless commitment towards the resolution of this case and to the maintenance of the peace and security of the university. Our collective strength and resilience matter. We extend our heartfelt thanks to each member of our university community for your continued prayer, support, and understanding. Together, we stand united in the pursuit of justice and the well-being of our university family. I want to reiterate our deep gratitude to many of you who have sent us messages those belonging to members of our faculty and staff. And even, I want to say, I have been deeply touched that some of our students sent messages to me asking, ma'am, how are you? I am praying for you. It means so much. We want to thank our parents, many of your parents, dear students, have sent messages to me and to several of uh, our administrators and even to our immediate family here, assuring us of their continued prayers. One of the administrators yesterday asked me, Mom, how are you? I said, I have felt the strength of the Lord. 
many are praying for us. So thank you so much to our alumni. Many of you have reached out to us as well. Thank you, thank you so much. We are pleased to announce to you that the university has extended financial support to the bereaved families. And I am pleased also that several members of our community have asked me, how can we help? We are grateful for your support. And one of the blessings that has been have been impressed upon us is to give full scholarship to one child of each family. One family has three very young children and the other has two young children as well. And the university has voted to give full scholarship to one child of each family from elementary, junior high, senior high, up to college. And if the child chooses to stay inside the campus, we are giving as well free dormitory and free cafeteria. This is the support that uh, we are giving to the bereaved families, but I appeal to our community, let us continue to pray for the bereaved families and for our university. I would like to appeal also that during this difficult time, what should pass from our lips should only be words of prayers. I discourage you to make speculations. Do not utter any word that you are not authorized to say. The only thing that we can say is uh, a prayer. So thank you that you will join us in finding strength in the Lord during this difficult time. I am confident that together we are united and the Lord will carry us through. Thank you so much. The Lord is with us and together let us stand united. continually invite God's presence as we worship him in spirit and in truth. Shall we bow our heads? Father God, we are happy that you have given us the gift of the Sabbath. We are here in this church to worship you. Thank you because your presence is in our midst and inside this campus. As we, the Lord, worship you, please uh, continue to uh, be with us. May you be with all the worship leaders as well as with all the worshipers on site and online. Thank you so much, o Holy Spirit, because you will speak to each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. The pastoral staff would like to welcome all of you to our worship. This is the last Sabbath of the month of November. So welcome to uh, Philippine International Church. All of you who are here in this uh, church today, as well as we would like to welcome all our online worshipers. Thank you for joining us in our worship today. In a very special way, we would like to welcome all our guest worshipers who have come to worship with us. And when your name is mentioned, Kindly stand, and those who are sitting beside them, kindly extend a handshake of 
fellowship to them. Welcome to the following guest worshipers coming from different places. Ricardo Bosico Jr. from Cebu City. Could you please stand? Brother Bosico? Oh, welcome to uh, PIC. Can you stand? A handshake of uh, fellowship to him. From uh, Binyan Laguna, we have uh, Mr. and Mrs. Um, Guico. Would you please stand? Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Guico? Oh, there. So, kindly extend a handshake of uh, fellowship to them. Welcome to PIC. Thank you for coming. Um, this is the first time that they have attended a worship here at PIC from Bakuor Kabiti. We have Yonora Frugal. Please stand. Sir Yonora? Okay, welcome to PIC. We have uh, Ilier Frugal. Please stand. Welcome. Welcome. We have Rayan Frugal. Welcome to PIC. Okay. And we have also Yesha Kamil Hernandez. All right. Could you please stand? Okay. Welcome to PIC. And we have from, actually they are from Kabiti also, Bakoor, but uh, they are working abroad from Hong Kong. We have um, Annalyn Rotone. Am I pronouncing your family name correctly? Welcome to, welcome to, to PIC. We have also uh, uh, Luther Lambuson. Okay, welcome to PIC. We have Michelle Lambuson. Please stand. Okay, welcome, welcome to PIC. From San Pablo City, meets James Hermogila, or Hermogila. I don't know how I'm going to pronounce your family name. Again, welcome to uh, Mitch James Hermogila. Are you around? Okay. Yeah, welcome. We have uh, J. Ann Hermogila. Please stand. Okay. We have Shimeya Faye Hermogila. Welcome to PIC and Christine Lutero. Welcome to uh, PIC. And to all of our guest worshipers, but you are not able to write your name in this uh, guest book, uh, in uh, this uh, guest worshipers log book, I am requesting all of our guests to please stand. All our guest worshipers, could you please stand? We want to welcome all of you to PIC. All of our guest worshipers, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming to uh, PIC and to the beautiful campus of AUP. And of course, those uh, online worshipers who probably some of you, this is your first time to attend our online worship, we're very much happy to welcome you to our worship today. Now, to all our guest worshipers who are here, I want to make this very important announcement. Please do not go home immediately, all our guest worshipers, because you are invited to attend a lunch fellowship sponsored by Barangay Dahilig. Am I correct? Barangay Dahilig will be the sponsor for this potluck or lunch fellowship. Please go to Gazebo. We have a building there, so please proceed immediately to that building after our worship. Um, at this point in time, I would like to give the time to one of our uh, associate uh, church clerks to uh, please read to us, and this will be the final reading of the transfer of membership. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. 
This is the final reading for the requests for transfer of church membership. From Philippine International Church to other churches, we have Balyaran Jonalin to Ban Banton Central Day Church, Romblon. The Silva Seferino Fiel, Mamsi Day Church, Pasay City. Grangos JR, Yasothong Day Church, Thailand. We have Pangesto Ibandia, Merbabos Day Church, Java, Indonesia. And Sumagaysay Bart Lawrence to Pasig Day Church, Pasig City. Mr. Chair, I move to accept the transfer of the this um, brethren from Philippine International Church to other churches. Is there any second? Seconded. Do you have any? Okay. So that is from PIC to other churches. Okay. Any objection to that? There's none. Approved. Now we will be reading the names of those who will be transferring from other churches to PIC. We have from other churches the Philippine International Church. If I read your name, please come over here on the stage so that we will welcome you. We have Claudel Elaine Joy, Claudel Manassas, and Claudel Vanasha Alexane from the Logan's Day Church, Maramag Bukidnon. Are you here? Please come up here, please. We have Hermano Christine Faith from Sampaloc Day Church, Galas, Quezon City. Hermano Louis Miguel and Hermano Ruby from Al Ahin Day Church, Abu Dhabi, UAE. Next, we have Rilioma Lailani and Rilioma Nestor from Nalak Day Church, Mabine, Isabella. And we have Balejos Leoven Kyle from Nalak Day Church, Mabini, Isabella. How about the rest that I've mentioned? Are you around? No? Rilioma Kaupo, Hermano. Okay, Mr. Chair, I move to accept this transfer of membership from other churches, the Philippine International Church. We have two brethren here, and... Uh... All right, any second? Seconded. Um, unfortunately, some of um, those, they are not uh, present today, but their transfer of membership, the moment we approve it, it will take effect immediately. Uh, is there any objection? None. So therefore, it is approved that we have additional members to Philippine International Church by virtue of transfer. So, welcome po sa PIC. Uh, sana po kayo ay Patuloy na sumuporta sa activity at mga programs ng uh, Philippine International Church. Maging kalahok sa lahat ng ating mga aktibidad at programa. Uh, God bless you. We have important announcements. Very quickly, I'm going to read it. Um, we are continually promoting because we want you, all of you, including our online worshipers, to be involved in the distribution of this missionary book, The Great Controversy. All you need to do is to sponsor a copy of this, is 75 pesos. So if you will be distributing 100 copies to your friends, to your acquaintances, to your loved ones, to your workmates, 
please approach us for 75 pesos per copy. Okay, online worshipers, if you want to be involved, kindly, kindly give us uh, a message. So again, our missionary book, please be involved in the distribution of this. Approach us, please go to our office so that you can sponsor copies of this. The next announcement is, uh, there is um, a poster circulating, circulating that uh, this afternoon there is a Bible questions explored or this is a Bible question and answer forum, but we are rescheduling that to next month, December 2023. So kindly wait for further announcement. Uh, we are uh, canceling that schedule this afternoon. Instead, we will do that maybe next month, December. A uh, specific date will be announced later. All right, uh, we have upcoming events. So please take note of this, especially for those who will be involved. Oh, by the way, I forgot to announce that this afternoon, this afternoon, to all women's ministries members, you will have a general meeting this afternoon, 4 o'clock, at Dr. Rosario's residence. If you do not know the residence of our beloved president, Dr. Rosario, she is staying or residing at Barangay Dahili. So you are invited, members of the women's uh, ministries. Upcoming events. Next Sabbath, December 2, first Sabbath of the month of December, everyone is invited to attend the Grand Sundown Worship at Centennial Park. It will start at 4.30 in the afternoon until 6 o'clock. So please be there at the Centennial Park. Again, again, next, the same December 2, please be here at PIC. Next Sabbath, December 2, at 6 o'clock in the afternoon because there is a, we will be having a cantata. And we will be featuring the uh, AUP Academy Choral and the Unceasing Cantica to uh, lead us in this cantata. This will be next Sabbath at 6 o'clock here at PIC. Elders Council meeting will be on December 2, next Sabbath at 2.30 in the afternoon until 4 o'clock at Tohino Corpus Hall. So please take note of this, all elders. And the last announcement we have, members of the church board, usually we have our meeting every first Sabbath of the month, but we will do it, we will have it on the second Sabbath of December. We are giving way to the cantata, so, our meeting is scheduled on December 9 at 4 o'clock in the afternoon at Tohino Corpus Hall. That's all. And may all of us be ready to worship our God. And we are thankful that we have worship leaders who have dedicated their time and efforts and who will be leading us in our worship. God's mouthpiece for today, our preacher, is one of the associate elders and the head of the stewardship department, brother, and hopefully soon will be, will be a pastor, brother Noli Arboleda. And uh, his preaching will be centered on uh, First Chronicles chapter 29, 11 uh, to 12. So as we worship God, let us continually pray and meditate on the message that we'll be, uh, that, that, that we'll be hearing today. And as we pray, as we sing, 
let us joyfully join in singing and attune our hearts to the one who will be leading us in prayer. And as we sing, let us sing with understanding. So as we worship God today, may all of us will give our utmost reverence to our Creator and let us observe solemnity. So God bless us all as we uh, go to our worship today. I would like to read uh, from the book of Psalms of David, chapters 103 and 29. And it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. This Sabbath morning, let us give our great God what he alone deserves, our complete worship and reverence. May his name alone be magnified in our worship. Disney.
please be seated. The Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment was instituted in Eden. After God had made the world and created man upon the earth, He made the Sabbath for man as a gift. On this special day, man and beast will cease from their work to celebrate God's memorial of creation. There are two institutions that God created before men fell into sin, the Sabbath and marriage. God's enemy will attack both institutions vigorously, especially as this world comes to the end. Various religions claim that the solemnity of the Jewish Sabbath, which is Saturday, was changed to Sunday, the first day of the week to honor Christ's resurrection on Sunday. God's enemies will also attack the family. There is nothing in the New Testament that shows that God changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. God does not change, and His laws do not change either. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one title will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. As we celebrate the Lord's Day here on earth, on the true day, we will continue to worship the Lord on His correct day in the new earth. In Isaiah 66, verse 23 says, And it shall come to pass from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me. May we enjoy God's continual gift of the 24-hour Sabbath, which starts at sundown on Fridays to sundown on Saturdays. May we truly find rest, not just for our weary body and mind, but for our spirit as well. Let us bask in God's presence to give Him the reverence due Him, and to enjoy the fellowship of our fellow believers as we worship God together this holy Sabbath day. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the gift of Sabbath day. Not just our body and our mind could rest, but actually our spirit, and we could be connected with you. So, Father, this morning as we worship you, we ask that you take all the uh, bad influence from this place. Ward them away, Father God, and may we just worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works. Psalms 105, verse 2. For our Sabbath expressions of praise, we'll be singing two hymns Be Thou My Vision and My Jesus, I Love Thee.
I would like to read from the book of Ellen G. White entitled Council of Stewardship. Chapter 1, Coworkers with God, the glory of the gospel. That man might not lose the blessed results of benevolence, our Redeemer formed the plan of enlisting him as his co-worker. God could have reached his object in saving sinners without the aid of man. But he knew that man could not be happy without acting a part in the great work. By a chain of circumstances which would call forth his charities, he bestows upon man the best means of cultivating benevolence and keeps him habitually giving to help the poor and to advance his cause. By its necessities, a ruined world is drawing forth from us talents of means and of influence. To present to men and women the truth of which they are perishing need. And as we heed these calls by labor and by acts of benevolence, we are assimilated to the image of him who for our sakes became poor. In bestowing, we bless others and thus accumulate true riches. As we faithfully return our tithes and our love offerings, we recognize that God owns everything. He has purposed that we become his trusted stewards and the opportunity to become his co-workers. His work that he wants us to be his co-workers is to share the good news of salvation to all nations. Tribe, language, and people. May the Lord continue to bless us as we commit everything to him. Our deaconess and deaconesses are now ready to collect our tithes and offerings.
Please stand. Father God in heaven, we would like to return our tithes and offerings to you. You had showered us with bountiful blessings and never let us lack of anything we need. Lord, we give freely our love to you. Thou take this and bless the hands of those who will handle it for the furtherance of thy work. I pray all this in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. I'm inviting you to get a hold of our, your Bibles, whether physical or electronic, so that we all can read our Bibles, the Holy Word of God. Let's turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 and 12. Again, that's 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 and 12. I will be reading from the New King James Version. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. May this be a blessing to us as we worship God today. Please kneel. Blessed, O you, Lord, our God and Father, yours is the greatness, the glory, the majesty. All that is in heaven, in earth, and in everywhere is yours. For this reason, we come before you today to praise and adore your holy name. O oh Lord, when we consider that in your hand is power and might, 
when we contemplate that every breath of life depends on your will, we cannot help but to cry out like King David, who are we that you are mindful of us? Yes, Lord, our finite mind cannot fully grasp and fathom how deep is your love, how boundless your mercy, that no matter how grave our problems, how terrible our mistakes, how dark our sins, how shameful our secrets, and how often we stumble and fall. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can come boldly to your throne of grace. We can pray to you for forgiveness. We can find salvation in you. At this moment, O oh Lord, we have to admit that in the dizzying pace of life, sometimes we forget to seek you first. We confess that sometimes we use our time, our words, the resources you have entrusted to us carelessly. Sometimes we even believe that success in life comes in the form of possessions acquired, in position occupied, in approval rating we enjoy from our colleagues or from academic degrees earned. O oh Lord, we confess today that sometimes we are selfish and greedy. Sometimes we do good because we want something in return. Oh Lord, sometimes we are not grateful. We grumble, we complain about anything. Oh Lord, sometimes we even delight in the weaknesses of others. We gloat over, we gossip about the infirmities and failures of others. Oh Lord, we confess that we are self-righteous. We forget and deny the fact that we are guilty of exactly the same faults and sin. But Lord, in spite of who we are and where we have been, we thank you for your amazing grace. For your mercy that you hand out freely every day and for the abounding blessings over us. Oh Lord, in view of the poly crisis that we see worldwide, some people feel helpless and terrified. But today, O oh Lord, I pray that you help us to believe that when we focus on our fears, on the crisis, our fears will grow. But when we focus on Christ, our fears will go. Help us to believe that Jesus allows storms of life to come not to destroy us, but to strengthen our faith. Oh, Father God, some may be grieving over the loss of a loved one. Some may be anxious due to back-breaking problems, financial health, family problems. Oh, Lord, I pray that you wrap up your loving arms around those who need it most today and give your peace which no one else can give. And now, O oh God, in a special way, we pray for your preacher, Brother 
Arnulfo Arboleda. Blister his lips with fire from heaven. That your word, your message, will cut deeply into our hearts, both to hurt and to heal. And when we depart, when we leave this sanctuary, may it be that our conviction, our earnest desire is to become more faithful stewards of thine. May it be that our constant desire shall be to breathe Christ, to sing Christ, to talk Christ, and to live like Christ. And now, may we experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst. These we ask in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Happy Sabbath, church family. Thank you so much for that wonderful music. Reminds me of our daughter who graduated here in 2010 as a nursing graduate. So I pray that you continue to be a servants of God as missionary nurses. Amen? Amen. I'm so glad that uh, we have the opportunity this day, this Sabbath day culminates our stewardship week emphasis. And I, th I would like to thank the leadership of both our university, our own president, Dr. Arcele Rosario, and also our uh, senior pastor, Pastor Lani Stavis, and all the members of the stewardship and finance team. And we all work together. And uh, the students here have the uh, privilege and the uh, opportunity to listen more about stewardship in their dorms last Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday nights. And last night, if you were here for the Vesper, or if not, you were able to worship through online, we have Pastor Shelito Kadao who passionately shared what biblical stewardship is. And so this morning, I would like to continue on, but with some focus on our stewardship. We just completed the uh, South East Asia Pacific Division year-end meeting, and our president, Pastor Kaderma, after all the presentation, the wonderful things that God had done through his children in every union, our SSD president said, you've heard how God has blessed his church and how God has blessed his people. Now, if there's anything that you need to remember, because there's so many things that were good, he said, it's about mission. It's about mission, and uh, I'm thankful that rightfully and timely, our study for the entire quarter for our Sabbath school is about mission. So you can see that all these things are orchestrated by our God. There is something happening in heaven. The Lord would like to come, but are we His children ready? So starting with our stewardship, Pastor Kado um, worked on this in the beginning and also at the end of his message. But in any learning process, it would behoove us to repeat, and then we will understand better. So here, let me just read, and then I'll give you a chance to read it with me. Stewardship is the lifestyle of one who has a living relationship with Jesus Christ accepts his lordship, walking in partnership with God, and acting as his agent to manage his affairs on earth. Now, I'd like you to, to work out, uh, to help me out. Let's all say it together from the screen. Let's start. Stewardship. Uh, let's try that again. Stewardship with Jesus Christ accept his walking in partnership with and acting as his to manage his affairs. Amen. Uh, you know, when I was in uh, the United States, I went to three different churches with my wife. And every churches, we actually um, facilitated what we call crown financial biblical studies and I believe uh, I led maybe six classes so um, between 8 to 10 per class for 13 weeks but this is the verse that everybody in the class has to recite not by reading but actually by memorizing and understanding it that is the basis of a stewardship there was a person who's about to lose her top secret clearance 
from the government because of her large debt. And the pastor said, Noli, could you take her and enroll her in the class? Maybe she's wondering, how could I pay my debt if I go to this biblical class? And uh, my brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, when you study the Word of God and believe it and live it, the Lord will bring miracles in your lives. So this is stewardship. It's not our initiative. It is God's initiative. Remember our first parents, Adam and Eve. When Eve was deceived by, by the devil through a snake, and then she offered the forbidden fruit to Adam. And when they sinned, they hid from the Lord God. But what happened? The Lord God looked for them, and he did not look for Eve, but he asked for Adam, where are you? And it did not stop there. When you go to the book of Genesis, if man is left alone on his own, he will just destruct himself. And we read in Genesis chapter 4, just right after they fell, and they were warded off from the Garden of Eden, what happened? They had a son, then another son, and then we had the first murder. That's what would happen if God is in not in our lives. We will just explode and implode. But God in His mercy, even after Genesis 11, when God's people were spread out, and they would like to build a big tower so that they would not experience the flood anymore and try to save themselves. We cannot save ourselves, my brothers and sisters. So God in his mercy called out Abraham from the land of earth. And we know that those are pagan people, but somehow Abraham listened and he became the father of faith. Because God promised Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. That is God's desire, my brothers and sisters. And so God chose Abraham, and he brought him to the land of promise, Canaan. But there was a long history, and God's people brought were brought to Egypt because of the famine and they were enslaved. But now it's time for them to get out and God has chosen them. Why did God purpose that his chosen people, the Israelites then, would stay in that particular section of a land? Because before the advent of internet and all this advanced communication Everyone who would go to Africa would go to Palestine. Everyone who would go to Asia from the other side will also go to the Palestine. And then when you go to Europe and you're coming from either Arabia or Africa, you would go through the land that God strategically placed his children. But what happened? They did not recognize the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So they rejected the Messiah. So their cup of, of uh, sin has filled up. But God's mercy continued on until AD 34, according to our prophecy. God rescinded Israel and opened the gospel to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 7, 59 to 60. That doesn't mean that God has turned his back on Israel because God has promised Abraham that we would be the father of many nations and all the blessings will come through Abraham. There was an occasion when the priests and the Pharisees and the scribes said, well, we have Abraham as our father. And Jesus said, I could make Abraham's son from this stone, so we should not pride ourselves as being Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Because if we do not do the work that God has called us to do, he will have the stone work for him. 
boasting, uh, this is the true Israel now. As the Lord opened the gospel throughout, using the Apostle Paul, these are the characteristics of true Israel, spiritual Israel. Galatians chapter 6, verses 15 to 16. Boasting only in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now it's a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, that is, being new creation and boasting only on the cross of Jesus Christ, they become the Israel of God. Now, both Jews and Gentiles who have faith in Jesus Christ, it's all inclusive now, we are spiritual Israel. My brothers and sisters, this is the point we, we, where we are in now as God's children. We are spiritual Israel. Now, God's mission, now that we are God's children, we will obey. And our uh, theme for our general conference for 2023 is that chosen for mission. And we sing, I will go. And then next year, the theme for South, Southern Asia Pacific Division will be evangelism. So in uh, July of next year, there will be a nationwide evangelism. Uh, we have some friends in Central Philippines right now that they have accumulated 10 million pesos for evangelism. How would it be? for us here in North Philippine Union Conference. God's reconciliation through Abraham, the Jewish nation through Jesus Christ, and now the spiritual Israel of God, is us. God has and will give us all the resources necessary from heaven to accomplish his mission. And we read in chapter 24, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So we know the conclusion of what would happen to this planet Earth. Now, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we see the signs throughout our uh, churches and also in our publishing works. And uh, the first angel, in succession, there's no time in between. God is calling everyone, the first angel, having the everlasting of God to preach to those who dwell on the earth. This are you and me, brothers and sisters, who already accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. But God has other sheep outside of the fold. And so in the second angel's message, get out of Babylon. That is the battle cry and cry for those who are still in the wrong beliefs. False teachings and are anti-God. And then the third angel, this is where the conclusion would be. Each one of us will have to make a decision whether we worship God or Satan. Now, some people would not like to talk about money. But Jesus talked about a lot about money and possession. In fact, six, 16 of the 38 parables were concerned with how to handle money and possessions. And this is from the book that we used for the Crown Financial, Your Money Counts by Howard Dayton. A friend of Hayward Dayton and he, they combed through the entire Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament because they had a business and it's a thriving business, but they don't know what God's um, a principle is in managing money. So they went and counted verse by verse, and they found out that the Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, fewer than 500 verses on faith, but more than 2,350 verses on money and possessions. Why is that? You know, during the crusade in the 12th century, we have this, what we call, what they call, not us, uh, holy war. So they had all these mercenaries on horseback, 
and uh, they want them to be baptized. And so they said, okay, ride your horses and go through the river and be baptized. But while they're going through the process, they had their sword up high. So they did not will, did not submit their sword, their will to the Lord. Likewise, us modern Christians, there might be areas of our lives. Pastor God all mentioned about those different T's. And then he said, the truth is a big one. And the biggest one actually would be treasures or earthly possession. Did you know that a lot of Christians are fearful of leaving this world? They are fearful. They have accumulated so much. There was a, a very successful businessman who took one of the ministers around on horseback, and they were going around for a long time. And then it, it starts to get dark, and so they sat at dinner. And then the successful businessman, businessman asked the minister, what do you think? He was expecting that he would get commendation. And the minister said, I think you're going to have a hard time leaving all this behind. My brothers and sisters, the right perspective. Money is good if used from the, for the proper purposes. Because God has rich people, even during Jesus' crucifixion. We have Nicodemus. We have um, Joseph of Arimathea. They minister to the Lord through their finances. Money and consecrated needed. This is from our sister Ellen G. White, Council on Stewardship. Thirty-five two, paragraph thirty-five point two. God's people are called to work to a work that requires money and consecration. Yeah, you know, we learned it from our Sabbath school lesson today. When someone is needy and they need uh, material things, we just don't say, I'll pray for you. You meet their needs in a practical way, maybe food, shelter, clothing, and money for the right purpose. The obligations resting upon us hold us responsible to work for God to the utmost of our ability. He calls for undivided service for the entire devotion of heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now she continues. Paragraph 35.4. There are only two places in the universe where we can place our treasures. And those are in God's storehouse or in Satan's. And all that is not highlighted in red, not devoted to God's service, is counted on Satan's side and goes to strengthen his cause. The Lord designs that the means entrusted to his stewards, that's you and me, that they may be carefully traded upon. Our Lord expects increase in what he has given us, Matthew chapter 25, and bring up a revenue to him in saving souls. This is the purpose, to save souls. These souls in turn will become steward of trust cooperating with Christ to further the interest of God's cause. NDR, IEL, rings a bell. So this stewardship of treasure is very important because if we do not handle this properly or understand this properly, we will be just like the young rich ruler. When he asked Jesus, what must I do to gain life eternal and Jesus said you have to sell everything the reason why Jesus said that because that is what was in his heart it doesn't mean that all of us would have to sell everything just to prove that we love the Lord but for this particular rich young man he was actually covetous he doesn't want to let go of the resources that he did not understand that actually belongs to the Lord now, God instituted the tithing system to provide for the Levites who took care of the temple and the necessary items and activities related to the temple. In modern sense, the tithe 
is to provide for our gospel workers, our ministers, supporting staff, our missionaries to meet their needs so that they could just focus on the work that God has called them to do. So instead of our pastors having businesses on the side, they would focus on actually working the work the Lord has called them to be. Amen? None of the tithe stays at the local church. So this is something that a lot of us don't understand. If we return our tithe and don't give offering, yes, we support our ministers and the workers, but nothing is left here in PIC. We do have a monitor here, and it doesn't work. It needs money to replace this. We have a clicker, but it doesn't work. I'm using my own. So there's a lot of need. When you, when you, when you kneel on the kneeling pad, you say, what's wrong with these church leaders? They don't fix it up. Well, where would they get the money if you don't give your offering to the Lord? So, all goes to the local mission or conferences. So there are four sources for God's mission. Now you see, brothers and sisters, I start to, to uh, step on your toes. And I would like to make a disclaimer now, because a friend of mine, when we were in San Diego, said, Noli, I'm not going to listen to that pastor's message again. I said, why? Every Sabbath, he's pinging on me and he's, he's uh, singling me out. What do you mean? Well, it seems like all his sermon is against me or about me. And I said, oh, it's about not giving your entire tithe, returning it. Well, that one and a few others. I said, don't worry, my brother. He's pinging on me too. Okay, so I said, let's get, let's get back to church next Sabbath. So, so we were back to church that Sabbath. But these are the four areas or sources for God's mission. The tithe, 10%. Offering, we'll talk about that. Donation and state. Now, we had a chance to visit one of our members here. She happens to be a lawyer, and uh, we discussed some of these things. Uh, and also, when I visited the Cavite Mission, I had a chance to speak with our Cavite Mission treasurer, and we talked about this, the tithe, offering, donation, and state. So tithe is 10%. Offering is what you have committed to the Lord. Some less than 10%, some more than 10%. Some twice the 10%. Some five times the 10%. Donation is while you're still alive, you can donate your properties to the cause of God. And state is supposedly when you have something written, your last will and testament, that you indicate where your resources would go. But a lot of times it doesn't, ha it doesn't happen here in the Philippines because the children can sue you and the law would favor them. So now, we would now go to Leviticus 27, 30, 32, going back to sandwich verse, but we, before we do that, because this would be this would be a little heavy, and it's difficult for me to deliver this God's message to you. But God would like to train us and what is important in this world and in the world to come. He said in Leviticus chapter 27, 30, as written by the prophet Moses, And all the tithes of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's, is holy to the Lord. So plants, you have to remember, they were an agricultural society. And then the herds and the flock. Every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. So the tithe is very, very holy to the Lord. In today's time, we don't bring our cows and uh, our baskets of produce. We give it in a form of money in check. But it's so important that um, if we have not been faithful with in returning God's tithe, he said, you can redeem it. You can cash up on your back tithe. 
How do we do that? In verse 31, it says, If a man or a woman, a businessman or a businesswoman, redeems any of his tithes, he must add a fifth of the value to it. That means if we have not been faithful in returning God's true tithe or faithful tithe, whatever that amount is, you add 20%, and now it's more that we owe the Lord. But why is that important? Does the Lord need interest or our money? Just like Mumbai, 5-6, you know, 20%. But God is trying to train His children. Okay, this is where we need to pray. Robbing God. Last Tuesday in the dorms, the title of our message was Robbers in the Church of God. So before we continue on, please pray with me. Father in heaven, Lord, it's a difficult topic, but you had your prophet Malachi the last prophet in the Old Testament. And after him, it was 400 years before the New Testament writers start, start to write. So this is very important. But Father God, give us ears that would listen and hearts that would understand and will that would obey what is it that you want us to be. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, a background on Malachi chapter 3. God's people have been waiting for the Messiah for a long time. And they keep saying, oh, it's no good to be serving the Lord. We see the, uh, the uh, people who are not serving the Lord. It looks, looks like they're doing good financially and everything else. And then God, through the prophet Malachi, says in chapter 3, verse 6, because they're having a confrontation. And so God says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, all sons of Jacob. God loves us. God loves Israel of old and even Israel of today. Everyone God created and God redeemed through Jesus Christ. So he says, it's only because of my goodness that you are not consumed. And I will continue my goodness and my grace and my mercy and love for you. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have done away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? And here we are now. And this applies to us too in the modern sense. Verse 8, will a man or woman rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? Mm. And this is what it is. Not just in tithes, but also in offering. In tithes and offering. So, I shared with you the four areas or sources of funds for God's mission. And so if we do not give donations or do not transfer our state for God's work, it is not called robbery in the Bible, at least. Maybe it's selfishness. If we return our tithe, but not our offerings, what is God calling us, brothers and sisters? We are... Uh, it's quiet in the church. If we return our tithes but not our offerings, God, through the prophet of Malachi, called us robbers. If we give our offerings but do not return our tithes, we too are robbers. And if we return funds and call it tithes but it's less than the 10%, we are also robbing God and robbing ourselves. Why? Because God promises, and we have to believe Him. Later on, before the end of our message, we would have a commitment. Our deacons and our deaconesses would have commitment cards and also extra tithe envelopes. 
Uh, being good stewards, don't waste the tithe envelopes. If you already are using the tithe envelope, ask the deacons and deaconesses, distribute them, pass it on so that we could save on the envelopes. So we would have commitment at the end. But here, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe, not just partial tithe, to the storehouse that there may be food in my house and test me in this. Is there any verse in the Bible when the Lord said, Try me. Test me. This is the only verse, my brothers and sisters, when God said, Try me. And later on in a few slides, I will show you people who trusted the Lord and the results of trustworthiness and being good stewards. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. You want to be flooded with God's blessings? You would have to trust them, starting with a tithe. And pour out so much blessings that you will not have room enough to receive it. It overflows. Luke 6, 38. Pressed down, shaken all together, and running over, will God give to your bosom. This is what happened. I pray that somehow you would, if you have not totally trusted the Lord, today you would trust Him, even partially. We'll take that. And the Lord will work through your faith, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Radical giving. It was Tuesday during the Passion Week of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew that he would die, but uh, something caught his attention. He saw the rich people zinging their big coins and making a lot of noise. And they're trying to make a uh, scene that they would be known as givers. But we see in Mark chapter 12, the account of this poor widow. Because a lot of times we would say that, I don't have enough. But God has given us an example in his book that even if we are poor, even we are not just widow who have no resources, but poor widow, that God will pay attention. You will get the attention of the Lord Jesus Christ because he knew that the poor widow gave everything. I would say that the poor widow did not just give the actually two small coins they call Lipton, but actually she gave herself. She committed herself, she, she uh, surrendered herself, and trusted that the Lord will provide. I'm not sure if she wrote, she read the book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. My God, uh, verse 19, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches by Christ Jesus. So this is small, 164 of denarius. During that time, a denarius is one sixty-four, uh, one day worth of wages. So in God's estimation, this poor widow put in more than all, not just one of those rich people, but all that they gave to the church that day or even before, put that all together, this poor widow gave more. Why? For they, the rich, put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Praise the Lord. Uh, short testimonies, and we'll move on. Um, we're supposed to have a video clip by one of our members, but they'll start with a little further place. There was a housewife, actually. She claimed she was a housewife, and I was still a practicing financial planner and advisor in San Diego. I had a call one day, and she said, my name is so-and-so, and I'm a housewife. Okay. I said, what could I help you with, madam? 
Uh, I called another uh, office and they said they need minimum of 300,000 to invest so that I could become their client. I said, okay, uh, what could I help you with? And so she shared with me what she would like to do. And I said, are you making decision by yourself? Oh, no, I have a husband. So I said, I cannot help you. You have to bring your husband with you. So the day of the appointment, they came. And they have loads of paperwork. Wow. And they had me going through their financial statements. They're making good money. But they were not tithe givers or returners yet. And they're not Seventh-day Adventists either. And, um, and I ministered to them, especially the wife, because the husband is so busy with her uh, profession. And she got excited one day. He said, Noli, we heard about tithe. Oh, tell me more. God said in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, if we return our tithe, he will bless us tremendously. And so I said, yeah, that's true. And then she asked, should I give tithe on the gross or the net? I said, well, how much blessings do you want from the Lord? I said, uh, well, why don't you give the gross? And then sure enough, the next year, she showed me their tax return. And they gave 600000 U.S. dollars. So that's back in uh, the U United States. And now when we, my wife and I were visiting uh, Mindanao, we met one of the uh, stewardship leaders in uh, one of our churches. And we had a chance to uh, converse. And I asked her, how's the stewardship in the church? And she said, everything's well. We collect uh, one million every no, uh, so many days or weeks maybe grateful to you. So what she did, she gave 10% for the tithe, uh, biblically, and then she gave 20% as offering. And aside from that, she has an extra uh, pile of money for evangelism and for the poor. And all the things that she could say, the Lord has been so good to us. The Lord allow us to have a son to finish medicine in AUP. I have a daughter who got allowed to finish accounting, and now she's taking law. And the Lord has allowed me to visit Israel even before we had a problem in Israel. And also the Lord allowed me to visit the seven churches in Revelation. So this sister is so excited about tithing, and God has honored her on that. Now lately, Korean businessman owner of a school, our, uh, one of our directors, ASI coordinator, Pastor Reyo, said, Ternoli, we have a Korean businessman, and he said he would like to talk to you because I happen to be involved with ASI. So I visited, we talked at the 1000 Missionary Movement, and he shared with me that he is a, or he was a backslider. And not only him, but a lot of other Korean businessmen. And sadly, he mentioned that even Korean pastors backsliding because they saw that business is more profitable than the income that they get from being a pastor. They didn't understand that being a pastor is the highest profession that anyone could have. Amen? So here it is. We had a second meeting. I had my wife with me and um, shared with me what he would like to do. He would like to do mission. And I said, how do we do that? I'd like to sell my school. Really? And what's the purpose? Because you're retiring? Uh, that, but actually it's for the mission. So God is actually calling his children, those who are already in the fold, those who are outside the fold, those who were in and went out, God wants them back in the fold. And we have a work to do, my brothers and sisters. Do not say or call them backsliders, although I did. I asked permission if I could share your story. 
I'm not going to mention his name, but we will be meeting on December 16. They asked me to share a message to the Korean congregation at 1000 Missionary Movement. And before we left his office, he intimated that, brother, you know, you would be the uh, first Filipino we would allow to speak to us. Wow. So pray for me, my brothers and sisters, that 100 plus Koreans would be able to get back to the fold. And uh, supposedly I could have a video clip from one of our members, but I don't think it came on time. We move on. This radical giving, when we were in Iligan, we talked to the sister, and she said, uh, you should visit uh, Butuan City in Agusa, Agusa del Norte. I said, why? Because the church actually started with something radical. What is that? 10, 10, 10. What is 10, 10, 10? 10% 10 tithe, 10% offering, and 10% for the poor. Wow. I think they must have learned from the old Israel lights where they give about 30% of their income and the Lord continues to bless them. And because they believe that too much, even if they're not the uh, spiritual Israel anymore, they still were blessed by God. So here in the Southern Philippine Conference, just 110 members. And if you know about Bisaya and Mindanao, my brothers and sisters, there are a lot of very, very, very poor people. But here we have this group of people who have committed themselves. They would like the Lord Jesus to come soon. And the way, the, on, the only thing that they could do it is under giving. So the last report from the treasurer, April 2023, their 10% of tithe was 181,500. But their offering relative to the tithe is 14%. Now, you would ask me, being the uh, member of the steward team here in PIC, where do we stand? Ours offering relative to the tithes is 4.4%. So praise the Lord for that. But 50% of that goes to the mission and only 50% stays here. So if we want to hold evangelistic meetings and to have the fund, we would ha it would have to come from the offering. So here, my wife and I would like to go back and really visit them. Uh, we were in BDO, and we look at the map, and it would take us about five and a half hours one way, and another five and a half hours drive back. And we decided that we will just visit them some other day. But you know what, brothers and sisters, we came back, and I was just curious. I went to their website, and I found a I, uh, an email address, and I emailed the church. It was a holiday, and in 10 minutes, guess what? I got a reply. Amen? This is how they look at their stewardship, not just in returning tithe and offerings, but in every areas of their lives, they do it with excellence for the Lord. So uh, we're going to ask our deacons and deaconesses now to distribute our uh, commitment cards. Uh, Sister Jack, could we, could we have our deacons and deaconesses or Sabbath school teachers so that we could do it rather quickly? And any volunteers here, let's get this. And also what we would like to do is give you the commitment cards and also a tithe envelope for those who have not been using the tight envelopes yet. And I would like you to trust the Lord. There was a great fire in Chicago in 1791. Dwight L. Moody was preaching on Sunday evening and is, spe and is speaking about what shall you do? Well, actually, rhetorically, Pontius Pilate asked, what shall I do with Christ? 
And that was the message he was trying to impart before the end of the service. And then he made a mistake. He said, next week, I'll come back and I will ask your decision about accepting the Lord. Some of those people, we don't know whether they were in the service or not, perished in the fire. One third of Chicago burned to the ground. And from there on, Dwight L. Moody did not repeat his mistake. So today, I will learn from what he learned that I will ask for a commitment. And this would incorporate all areas of our stewardship. So do we have our deacons and deaconesses already distributing the commitment cards? Uh, Pastor Lan is here. We need um, school, um, student leaders. Uh, whoever you are, pick uh, cards and distribute it to everyone. It would be easier if we could have our deacons and deaconesses get some copies from Pastor Stavis and pick your commitment card. We'll go over it. Uh, here comes our deacons. Uh, we need more help. Sabbath school teachers, come and help out. This is part of our stewardship. We see the need and we step up. And we come forward. You don't have to be a man to do it. Everyone, as we come to a conclusion. Now, as they are giving those, distributing those commitment cards, because a lot of our students actually have limited finances, and this would pertain to them. And also for us, the experience of one non-Adventist. Reason why I mention non-Adventist, I have to make a deduction because he didn't mention about tithes and offerings. He talked about donation. But here is a person who was moved. I don't know how, but he was a student then. Now he's 74 years old. And he said, the newness of being wealthy has worn off. My career spanned 40 years. I achieved financial freedom before age 30. We have been very fortunate. The things that were major purchases are behind us. When I left college, I vowed that I would donate 60% of my net income to a human service agency that would provide housing and job training including placement to the homeless. Each time my salary increased, so did my contribution. Since I was a CEO, my contribution was not insignificant. I kept this pledge up today. And the Lord blessed this person. Not a Christian. Well, in this, in this estimation, not at least a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. But I learned from one of the senior pastors in Loma Linda Church, and he had to borrow this too. Wherever your greatest passion is, meets the greatest need of the world, that is your ministry. And then corollarily, where the greatest need of this world and where your greatest passion is, where they meet, that is God's calling for you. And this right here is God's calling for this non-Seventh-day Adventist Christians, but he responded. The only commendation, my brothers and sisters, although Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, and verse 23 are identical, but I would rather be a steward of Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. Why? Because if I have five talents, I use it for the Lord's mission and for His glory. He would give me five more talents for His glory. And whatever one talent that the other guy hid, He would also give that to me so that I would have more that I could do more for my Lord.
I pray this morning that this would be your desire. And if I could have somebody on the piano as we go, could we have someone on the piano to, uh, to just uh, play all to Jesus, I surrender? Anyone? Any piano player? Any talents in the church? Thank you, brother. You know, in the, in the world made new, in the earth made new, I will be playing the piano. Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll just play it on the piano because we still have the deacons uh, on the balcony distributing. And then we'll go to the process. Thank you, my brother. May God give you more talents, not just on the piano, the saxophone, the guitar, whatever God wants you to have. You don't have to sing it, but this is a preamble as we go to the commitment cards. And it's not just about money, because the card would cover all areas of our stewardship. Why a lot of Christians don't understand. They think um, their church would just like money. They think that Jesus would like their money only. But what Jesus is doing is preparing us for the world to come. There would be no selfish person in heaven. There would be no person who hoards in heaven. He will not make it to the gate because he has so many buddy buying boxes. My brothers and sisters, the Lord used the prophet Malachi, the last warning for his erring children. And today, in one way or another, we are erring children. And God in his mercy would like to spank us, but not to hurt us but to correct us. The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing into the division of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and a discerner of the hearts and intents of men. The Apostle Paul wrote to his young protege, Timothy in the second letter chapter 3 verse 16 and we read all the scriptures Monday Tuesday Thursday Friday with Pastor Cado and now today that the Lord is calling us back to be true is towards nothing between my Lord and my Savior so whatever it is that is in between you and the Lord give it up and the Lord is calling us, you and me, to be faithful stewards. Can we do it? Not on our power, but the Apostle Paul promised us in Philippians 4.13. Could you help me? I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Brothers and sisters, time is short. There is a sense of urgency for God's remnant people to respond to the call of God, starting with our time, continuing with our talents. Thank you, my brother. And the, uh, go ahead. And the uh, temple that God has given us, we have to take care of this because if we are sickly, God cannot use us. Our ties, our relationship, starting in your Jerusalem, your own family, in Judea, in Samaria, and into all the rest of the world. Our terrain. Are you going to trash this earth? Because we read in the book of Peter that the Lord will burn it up with a fire. No, 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 my brothers and sisters. We are stewards of God's resources. 
And he would like that a child of God, as true Seventh-day Adventist Christians, would be distinct, a holy people, separate, yet goes out and reaches out to those who are in darkness. Because he has taken us from utter darkness, and he has brought us to his light. I believe the, uh, the deacons already had all the uh, commitment cards distributed. Now we will go through this commitment ceremony. You have your card? When I went to the uh, biblical study, we actually have a study on returning everything, committing everything to the Lord. And not only will we sign it, but we also have a witness. But here, uh, it's just a signature, but if you want a witness, and what you do is put it on your refrigerator and then put it uh, by your ceiling or you, before you sleep or something. And before I came here, my wife who was sick, reminded me, Dad, don't forget to give our offering. So this morning, look at the screen or your cards and follow after me. I promise to set apart the first moments of each day to commune with the Lord through prayer and study of the Bible, spirit of prophecy and the Sabbath school lesson and in family worship. Brothers and sisters, you care about your children? The enemy is winning in a lot of families because we have not done our part. We have not prayed for our children. We have not studied God's word. We have not read the guides that the Lord has given us in Sister White, the Sabbath school lesson and family worship. If you would like to be like our Lord Jesus Christ, and you promise, you put a check at the side to set apart the first moment of this day, just like the Lord Jesus Christ, Early in the morning, he thought, his father, our father. Put a check mark on that. Second one is to improve my relationships, growing in faithfulness, forgiveness, and loving by principle. We have a lot of broken families. Yes, a lot of our churches sweep it under the rug, but somehow now they're having the courage to bring it out. And by God's grace, the Lord will heal his children. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. So is there a spat? There is a quarrel in the family? You want to improve it and commit it to the Lord? Put a check mark on the right side. You want to be healthy so that the Lord could use you? And you can be like uh, Pastor Doug Bachelor at his age. He can still do a flip-flop or flip. Or um, some of our healthy brothers and sisters. They look young, but they're actually seniors. So establish one new healthy habit to better serve the Lord with my mind. You know, our mind is related to the food we eat. If we eat a lot of fatty food, the blood would be too slow coming to our brains and we would not be able to think right. And so when we have spiritual things which are spiritually discerned, we cannot understand it because our blood is full of cholesterol. To offer one day or evening each week to work for God, spreading the good news to others through Bible studies, small groups, etc. Total. Involvement, total mission involvement. And then number seven, to keep the Sabbath, preparing for it accordingly on Friday, keeping its limits, right thoughts and activities. Would like to be more faithful on that so that you could honor the Lord God. Put a check mark on that. Now we come to the last 
screen. The Lord's calling us to faithfulness because He would like to bless us. If we test Him, or try Him, believe Him, and start doing it today, He will be faithful. God is not a man that He would lie. What He said, He means, and what He means, He says. 10% of our income, return it to the Lord. The last one, to dedicate a personage of my income as a regular offering to the Lord. I will commit to the Lord that I will not give only when the offering plate is placed in front of me. Because starting first Sabbath of January, we will not collecting offering for Sabbath school anymore. So we would like that everybody would learn that it would be all combined offering. So this giving. I vacillated on the title of this uh, sermon. I thought about titling it as The Joy of Giving, The Joy of Living, but I settled on God's partners, partners of God. He will elevate us and promote us. It's, he said in John chapter 15 that He will not call you and me any more servants, just like His first apostle, uh, disciple. But He will call you and me friends. Because a servant doesn't know what the Father is doing. But a friend would know through Jesus Christ. Amen. So, um, I pray that you have committed. And now our senior pastor would seal our commitment this Sabbath morning. If you have received this commitment card, and you want to uh, show your willingness to uh, make a covenant with God, fulfilling these promises that we want to uh, fulfill for the glory of God, may I request you to please stand. For those who have not received, because the number of copies is insufficient, but you have read it on the screen and you subscribe to the idea and principles, could you please stand also, including those in the balcony? I will be offering a commitment prayer for you. Let's pray. Our benevolent God, Creator and Savior of mankind, the owner of everything in the entire universe, we acknowledge that we are your stewards, trustees, or agents of the things that you have created here on earth. You have made clear in the Holy Writ a subject that we need to understand more and more importantly, to apply the truth and principles of stewardship by every one of us. Your desire is for us to abide in you all the time. Because apart from you, we become helpless, miserable, and hopeless. Thank you for reminding us through the message of your steward, Brother Arboleda, that the best thing for us to do in life is to live and walk in partnership with you. Doing this is a manifestation of our faith and love in you, nothing else. Even when we work, serve, and worship, may it be all prompted by our faith and love in you. This morning, Perhaps each of us here received the commitment card. This is to signify that we want to make a covenant with you, O God. O Lord, we have read things that are written in this commitment card. Help us all to fulfill those vows happily and faithfully. 
May the Holy Spirit enable all of us to do it and just surrender ourselves to you. Thank you so much, the Lord, for the opportunity this morning that we can make this kind of agreement and covenant with you. May you accept this commitment that we are making between you and us, your people. Thank you, Lord, for accepting our humble commitment in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. For our hymn of consecration, shall we all stand and sing, I will sing of Jesus' love. Father in heaven, thank you again, Lord, for your love for us, although it's a harsh verses from your prophet Malachi, but you did it because of your love for us, because we have turned our back from you, and we have not trusted you. Now, Father God, I ask for empowerment from the Holy Spirit, especially in our giving even in our offerings. Empower us that even if we give 0.5%, because that's all we are willing to test you with, or even 2% of the tithe initially, Father God, but in your mercy, you will bring things in your children's life that as they move forward in faith, that you will provide not just their need for themselves and their family, but the money needed to finish the work for your mission and to save more people into your kingdom. I pray and thank you in Jesus' name.
Sabbath.